What makes you want to play a game again? There are a number of qualities that a game can have that can bring its past player base back for more. Branching paths in the story that can lead to major changes in the campaign. Harder difficulty options so you can experience the game again with your now hopefully advanced skills. And if your skills aren't advanced yet, you might play a game again just to understand how to play better and continue to flesh out your understanding of the game's mechanics. Character and party customization options can completely transform how you handle challenges presented by the game and make facing them again feel fresh. And games that rely on other players, whether it be competitive ranked games or simple party games, can feel fun and fresh each time you play them. Options, variety, and deep mechanics give life to games past the first time you play them. And many of my favorite games have these things in spades. Hollow Knight offers the player a huge world to explore in a very non-linear way, and the satisfaction of learning the layout of the map and refining your combat abilities makes playing the game again worthwhile. All of the mainline Pokemon games have insane party customization options. When considering all the Pokemon, there are literally quadrillions of possible combinations of six party members, which isn't even to mention the diversity offered by held items, moves, alternate forms, and each Pokemon's extra hidden stats. Party games like Mario Party, Mario Kart, and the Jackbox Party Packs are all games that I will never say no to when given the opportunity to play them with friends, because of the inherent fun of interacting with and competing with your friends. Most of the inherent appeal of classic arcade games such as Pac-Man, Galaga, and the like is score chasing, the simple desire to improve and see your high scores go up. Another way that people have gotten more mileage out of their favorite games is by randomizing them. You've likely seen randomizers for games like Pokemon, some of the 3D Legend of Zelda games, or Metroidvanias like Hollow Knight. Randomizers randomly change the location of items and the enemies you encounter based on the seed that you generate at the start of each randomized run. This adds replayability by creating new challenges through the restriction of your available tools and changing the emphasis of different game elements. Minecraft, one of the, in my opinion, best and most influential games of our generation, is highly replayable due to the satisfaction of progressively improving your tools and the unique generation of each world, creating scenarios and landmarks that only you will ever experience. Games that bring their players back for more tend to be great, usually. And my personal favorite game that I've spent over 2,500 hours playing across seven years is The Binding of Isaac Rebirth. Isaac has all the qualities that I just listed, and they are what makes it special. The tools that will be available to you, the player, will change every time you play the game, you get opportunities to draft items to push your build in a specific direction. The game will push you to improve at the game by continually introducing new elements, such as enemies, items, and stages as you play. You can play with friends, you can take different paths, and you can continue to chase better and better play by learning how to better use the tools that you are given. Isaac is a roguelite game. I won't go into the minutia of why Isaac is a roguelite and not a roguelike, since it isn't relevant to this video. But being a roguelite basically means that there is a random map generated each run, which is each time you start a new game, permadeath, game unlocks persist in every run you have, but if you die you have to start from the first level again, and each run is unique. In those seven years, I've gotten all 637 achievements, at least twice each, gotten a 100 win streak as Eden, finished in the top 10 in the daily challenge many times, my personal best placement being second, and learn the name, sprite, and effect of all 700 plus items. Wow, get a life, right? So what is The Binding of Isaac actually about, and what does it actually play like? The gameplay of the game is based on the dungeon exploration aspect of the original Legend of Zelda, and the story of Isaac is that the titular five-year-old boy, Isaac, overheard his mother receive a message from God. As explained in the opening cutscene, God's message to Isaac's mother was to sacrifice Isaac as a proof of her devotion. To escape her, Isaac flees to the basement and continues down through the floors, reaching deeper and deeper depths. There are many religious game elements and interactables, such as angelic gifts, seals with the devil, and objects used to practice Christianity. The majority of the characters and enemies are drawn in a cute style that is betrayed by the horrific details surrounding them. This juxtaposition gives the game a unique flair and is one of the first things that stood out to me when I was introduced to the game, although my appreciation of the game now has gone far beyond that and left that initial interest behind. To give a brief history of The Binding of Isaac, the art of the original game, which The Binding of Isaac Rebirth is a remake and expansion of, was done by Edmund McMillan, who was also the developer and designer of the game. Florian Himsel was the other designer and the programmer of the game, and Danny Baranowski created the music for the game. 
The Binding of Isaac questions the dogma of religion and Catholicism, which Edmund was exposed to growing up, as his mother's side of the family was Catholic and his father's side were born-again Christians. He felt shunned for his interest in Magic the Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons by his family, and even said that the darker imagery of Isaac is pulled from real stuff that he heard happened semi-tied into family stuff. Like, they would never call me on this. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's the beauty of the situation, is the people that would actually be offended by this in my family would never admit, you know, to these things. Yeah. Like, I, I guarantee that the person that told me that I was going to go to hell would never even admit to it. I don't think they would see it. Like, I'm just not... I'm not, that part of my family is cut off for obvious reasons, mm. and it just wouldn't, it wouldn't happen. I'm the kind of person that when I start working on something, and it starts being, it just starts flowing out, you know, and I try to be as honest as I can with everything and not censor what I'm trying to say or, or do, and if it gets dark and weird and I start going like, eh, maybe I shouldn't say this, that's when I know I should. <laughs> like, that's the point where I realize that I'm doing something that, if I'm hesitant, that means there's something of value there that needs to be explored. Edmund McMillan's biggest success before The Binding of Isaac was with the game Super Meat Boy, which he had released less than a year before he started to work on The Binding of Isaac. Isaac was not expected to sell well or be popular. Edmund was making the game for his own sake, to relax after having to compromise with and be subject to the suits, as he called Microsoft's businessmen that he had to interface with when working on Super Meat Boy. Edmund actually expected the game to perform so poorly that he thought putting it on sale on Steam was taking advantage of the platform. To his amazement, the game was hugely successful despite its rough edges. In just a bit more than a year, the game reached 1 million sales. It still felt like a compromise. So after that, I wanted to make something where I didn't compromise at all, and I wasn't thinking about money at all. Um, and I'd like to think. The Binding of Isaac is probably one of my purest, you know, free form moments. It's, it's, it's Binding of Isaac represents me the most out of anything I've ever done. I was able to just go hard. And there were times where I'm like, do I want to do this? Is it genuine? Yes, it's genuine. Just do it. Like, just put it in. Just three years after the release of the original game, The Binding of Isaac Rebirth was released. This remake and expansion was made because of the limitations of the original game's engine. Because the original Isaac was made in Flash, there were many limitations, complications, and issues in the game. Edmund was not able to continue making content for the game like he wanted to because of these limitations, and I can personally confirm that yeah, the game had issues. When playing the game on my Mac in 2014, the game slowed to a crawl sometimes, and if I were not so in love with the gameplay loop, I would have stopped playing due to the slowdown. Edmund said during the development of Rebirth, and many times since then, that Isaac doesn't belong to him anymore, it belongs to the fans, and his attitude towards the game shows that. Rebirth has since had three DLCs released for it, with Repentance being the final DLC, for real this time. Beyond the theme and presentation, as was previously mentioned, Isaac is a roguelite, specifically a dungeon crawler roguelite. You explore procedurally generated floors that, at least for the first half of the game, will always have an item room, a shop, a boss room, and two secret rooms. Additionally, sometimes other special rooms may spawn to further incentivize exploration and add more variance to the runs. These special rooms will be connected through a series of rooms, usually filled with enemies, whose rooms will sometimes yield loot to help you advance through the basement. Every part of the level generation, item spawns, room drops, etc. is determined by the seed, which is randomly generated when you start a new run. You can also manually enter a seed for a run, and you can play the same exact run as someone else. The core gameplay loop of Isaac consists of exploring the floor and fighting monsters, which will bring you to special rooms that have valuable items, and using those items to fight the increasingly stronger bosses and monsters. At least, that's the basics of the gameplay loop. As you play the game more, you will come to recognize the items and other gameplay elements that you encounter and become better able to utilize the benefits that they provide you with, or in some cases avoid the negatives that they would give you. Here in this clip, both players are playing on the same seed, which as previously mentioned means that all the rooms, loot, etc. will be identical for both of them. The decisions made by the players and the consequences of those decisions are the only differing factors between these runs. As you will see these runs play out, the gamer will take advantage of the tools that become available to them while exploring, and the noob will mostly just find the boss and item room, then advance to the next floor. 
In my opinion, the best part of the game, and where the real game begins, is once you learn enough about the game's mechanics, items, and interactables, and you can start optimizing your gameplay. The puzzle-solving element of knowing how to fit the tools you are given together in unique and creative ways keeps the player engaged and makes for very rewarding gameplay, especially when you get a great item out of it. These clips only show the first two floors, and already you can see that the gamer has way more stuff than the noob. Literally three times as many items, including an extra guppy item and way more money. The rift between two players on the same seed can become far more extreme by the end of a run. Edmund McMillan said in a live stream that that was where the game really starts. Once everything is unlocked and you can play with every piece of the game and learn how they all fit together and interact. It makes sense to me that I'm so passionate about the game and have been able to play it for so long when I see the strengths of the game in such close alignment as to how the game designer sees them. The depth to the game, and its replayability, are the greatest strengths to The Binding of Isaac. Because the game is a roguelite, it is made to be played many times. It is impossible to beat the game in just one run, and unlocking everything will take many more runs than it will take you to beat the game for the first time. If you've never played a roguelite, that may sound tedious, having to play through the same game over and over again, but that's the beauty of many roguelites. Every time you play, it's unique. Here are a few different runs using the same character. Even if you know nothing about the game, you can tell that these runs play very differently. What keeps roguelites from getting stale for me is the fact that you are pushed to learn mechanics, patterns, and interactions, rather than memorizing level layouts or button combos. To relate this to a game that almost all of you have certainly played, in Minecraft, you don't memorize the location of the stronghold, rather you learn the steps to use your resources to locate it, allowing you to have unique experiences and stories each time you do end up reaching the stronghold. If you played Minecraft on Hardcore, it would actually be pretty similar to a roguelite, due to the random elements and permadeath. Speaking of other roguelites, what does Isaac do different or better than other roguelites? I've played a decent number of other roguelites and likes. Slay the Spire, Spelunky, Crypt of the Necrodancer, Nuclear Throne, Dicey Dungeons, Goner, Flinthook, FTL, Downwell, and Monolith. I like all these games, some very much so, but Isaac stands out from the rest of these games to me. Isaac is by far the most open of any of these games. The number of interactions and possible creative applications of the tools available to the player are far more limited in all of these games. This makes a lot of sense for FTL, Slay the Spire, and Dicey Dungeons, since they are turn-based games, but Nuclear Throne, Goner, Flinthook, and Downwell are all also much more on rails than Isaac. Their gameplay consists mostly of just running and gunning, with only a few places and objects to interact with in interesting ways. Spelunky and Crypt of the Necrodancer are much more relatively open, providing the player with randomly generated maps with items and enemies that the player is free to interact with, but the interactions that those interactables have with each other is very limited. The way you become stronger in Isaac is by continually gathering items that stack upon one another, but in Spelunky, many of the items take up the same limited slot. By the end of the game, the number of bombs and hearts you have is usually what makes you stronger than you were at the beginning along with a cape or jetpack that you can get early in the game. I love Spelunky too, and preventing the player character from becoming overwhelmingly powerful allows the gameplay to stay challenging and tense at any stage of the game, but it also prevents most runs from developing an individual identity. Rather than asking the player to use the tools given to them to overcome obstacles in unique and creative ways, Spelunky asks the player to perfect its relatively limited number of mechanics and stages in pursuit of perfect performance. Necrodancer comes a little closer to the level of creativity and divergence in Isaac, but is still miles behind in that aspect. In the game, you can hold a torch, shovel, weapon, armor, item, ring, boots, helmet, two spells, and any number of the game's nine charms at once. Where it falls behind is the interactions that these items have with each other. Very few of the items interact with one another, and almost all of the item slots have direct upgrades that simply increase their respective stat more than any other item of that type. For example, three of the nine torches that you can find are objectively worse versions of the Luminous Torch, which gives the max level of vision to the player that a torch can. And I think that the Luminous Torch, as well as every other torch, is simply outclassed by the Torch of Strength, which provides plus one vision and strength. There are four other torches that provide effects other than Vision Radius, but those effects don't interact with any other items and are generally underwhelming compared to plus one strength. 
The same is pretty much true for armor and shovels, although the weapons specifically are very transformative to the gameplay in interesting ways. Again, I love Crypt of the Necrodancer, and by being a turn-based rhythm game, it offers a unique experience from Isaac, but it does not have the magical aspect of interaction and imagination that Isaac provides. To focus more on the depth that Isaac has to its mechanics, here is a description of one of the game's most interesting items. Glowing Hourglass is an item that, on use, sends you back in time to before you entered the current room. The benefits of this may seem small, until you consider how this one item can interact with everything else in the game. On its own, you can use this item to undo rooms where you took a lot of damage, but when interacting with other game elements, you can use it to reduce the effect of Curse of the Blind by taking a blind item, seeing what it is, then deciding if you want to go back to before you picked it up. You can use it to see if you have enough money to get a beggar to pay out, and get all your money back if you do not. You can use it to check what unknown pill's effects are, and go back in time if the pill gives you a stat down. If an item room has a bad item, you can go back in time to before you entered it to increase your chance of finding a planetarium on a future floor. In conjunction with sharp plug or question mark card, you can get essentially infinite retries on any room. This one item interacts with so many other elements that it's crazy. Not every item is like this. Some items simply give your character more health or damage or something. But that doesn't change the fact that there are already an unimaginable number of interactions between all the game elements. Another great aspect of the game is the Steam Workshop integration that was added in Afterbirth Plus. I can't say anything for the actual process of creating mods, but as a player and consumer of mods, the integration is great and mods only take one click to install. There are over 7,000 Isaac mods on the workshop, with new ones coming out daily. For as long as the modding feature has been out, I've checked in on the workshop front page every week or more to check out the new high quality mods. Mods range from alternate soundtracks, new characters and items, extra enemies and bosses, cosmetic changes, to even new DLC sized expansions, such as with Fiend Foilio and Revelations mod. Mods that add interesting new items and interactables usually, from my experience, have some small bugs that rear themselves in edge cases, such as the Marshmallow mod, which would sometimes just cause the item to disappear, or the Lost Plushie mod, which would bug out if you rerolled your run while holding it, or the Sewing Machine mod, which will sometimes jam and not do anything when you try to interact with it. Personally, I usually don't like playing with mechanics that are not working consistently as intended, and will usually end up unsubscribing from mods that have bugs like these but the fact that they are here at all is amazing. Just because a mod doesn't become a part of the pantheon of items and game elements that I will play with for thousands of hours, doesn't mean that I got nothing from playing with it temporarily. Cosmetic mods are usually the ones that have the most longevity to me. Item Pedestal Overhaul is a great example of a mod that enhances the game visually in an unintrusive and intuitive way by giving items unique pedestals specific to the floor and kind of room that they're picked up in. I also play with a music mod called Rescored Beats to Repent To, which has just replaced the game's regular soundtrack to me, and has been the music playing in this video. Other mods like that, such as Mega Satan's Bling, I Guy's Extra NPCs, and Tatan Names, just give more visual polish and contribute to a more expanded experience. And if I'm playing the game just for fun and for unlocks, I will even use some of the mods like Trinket Stacking Plus and Tarot Cloth Plus that complete a couple mechanics that seem simply unfinished or forgotten. Spin Down Dice Preview and Planetarium Chance are also mods that I would recommend for expanding players' UI to show stats and information that they technically have access to, to make gameplay more convenient. There are also mods for new game modes, although I haven't experimented with those very much, as I think that the core Isaac game mode offers the best possible gameplay to experience the game's mechanics through. So no matter what kind of player you are, there will be mods for you to enjoy, ranging from items, enemies, rooms, cosmetics, to advanced UI. An element of Isaac that I think goes somewhat underappreciated is its scaling difficulty. The first time you play the game, things are easier, and the game is shorter. After getting your first win, you unlock the Womb, which is another two floors that increase all damage to a full heart rather than a half heart. In the Womb, you fight Mom's Heart as the final boss, and after beating Mom's Heart nine times, it gets permanently upgraded into It Lives, which spawns harder enemies and has more health. After beating It Lives for the first time, you unlock the path to the next chapter of the game, which is the choice to go to Shoal or Cathedral. Killing the boss on these floors five times each will unlock their respective item, 
the Polaroid, or the negative, which allows you to advance to the final floors of the game, being the chest and dark room. After beating either of these paths fully, finally unlocks the final boss, Mega Satan, on either of the final floors. This was the complete progression in the base game of Rebirth, and still stands in all the following DLCs. However, Afterbirth Plus added another alternate final floor and boss, the Void and Delirium respectively. To get to the Void, you need to enter a portal which has a chance to spawn after killing every story boss, and is guaranteed to spawn after and unlocked by killing Hush, which is an optional boss added in Afterbirth that is also unlocked by killing Mom's Heart ten times. And in Repentance, two more alternate paths were added, Mother and the Beast. To unlock Mother, you must kill Hush three times, and then take an alternate path which is unlocked at the same time. And finally, to unlock the Beast, you must kill Mother, and to encounter the Beast, you must return to the first room in the Depths 2 after killing Mom and having taken the Polaroid or the Negative, which allows you to travel through previous floors until you reach home and fight the gauntlet of bosses leading up to the Beast herself. As you can tell, many runs are required to unlock access to all the endgame bosses. This allows the player to get wins more easily in the beginning, and prevents the player from getting too overwhelmed by the number of floors and bosses that they can encounter. This can seem frustrating for players that may already be experienced with the game and are playing on a new save file, but there are ways to get around these restrictions. Sacrifice rooms can spawn on almost any floor, and playing one 12 times and beyond gives the player a 50% chance to teleport to the dark room each time they step on the spikes. If the player has not unlocked access to Shoal in the Cathedral yet, if a Devil or Angel room is earned on the Womb 2, rather than containing rewards, it will instead have a path to the next floor. Confident players can take advantage of this by purposefully not qualifying for an Angel or Devil room two floors prior to Womb 2, to guarantee they will get a chance to travel an extra floor deep after Womb 2. This strategy can even be used on regular runs to prevent Angel or Devil rooms from spawning on a floor where you have already seen the room with a Joker card or Red Chest teleport and maintain an increased chance to get one on the next floor. The error room can also be used to reach levels that haven't been unlocked, although this method is much harder to do. The incentive to unlock all these bosses is the unlockables that you receive by killing them. Every story boss, as well as boss rush, award a mark on that character's post-it note once that character has killed it. Each mark corresponds with an unlock, usually an item, that can now spawn. This pushes the player to complete several runs as each character, which makes them spend enough time with each character to learn the unique strategies that work best for them. The fact that this must be done across several runs also means that getting lucky in finding an overpowered item combination early on in a run will not make all the post-it marks trivial. Barring the use of R key, the lowest possible number of runs it takes to complete a character's post-it note is 5, but more realistically you can expect it to take 6 to 8 successful runs and that is only after all the bosses have been unlocked, which can be expected to take 24 successful runs. The incentive to unlock as much stuff as possible in each run adds an extra dimension of possible optimization to runs that eventually becomes lost once all unlocks have been achieved. For example, in a single run, you could defeat Boss Rush, Mom's Heart, Mother, The Lamb, Mega Satan, and Delirium, all in the same run. This can be done by fighting those bosses normally while picking up the key pieces on the way, killing Mother, then using a sacrifice room to go to Dark Room, killing the Lamb, killing Mega Satan, and finally getting the portal to Void and killing Delirium. Normally you wouldn't expect to be able to fight Mother and any other boss after Chapter 3, but with some knowledge and application of the game's mechanics, you can complete more things in a single run, which I think is a great reward to learning how to take advantage of the interactable elements of the game. Not everything that is unlocked is good, though. After beating Mom's Heart five times, you unlock Everything is Terrible, which makes the game harder by reducing heart drops, increasing the spawn of champion enemies, and adding more difficult room layouts. Some of the items that are unlocked are even bad. Items like Guillotine, Isaac's Heart, Missing No, D12, Brown Nugget, Shade, Dark Prince's Crown, Magic Skin, and Meat Cleaver all have either serious downsides or provide very little benefit to the player compared to other items that could have appeared in their place. This is not a bad thing. For one, I think that the number of good unlocks far exceeds the number of bad ones. And secondly, not every item in the game needs to be good. Isaac is all about getting a random hand dealt to you, and learning the mechanics well enough to know how to leverage your hand to achieve a win. If every item were good, then the game would be trivial, be less diverse, and have fewer punishes for lack of planning on the player's part. 
Every item with significant downside can be situationally good. For example, Isaac's Heart is an amazing item when you are playing as Tainted Maggie, because the body contact damage stacks with Maggie's lethal hug, and it allows you to get more red heart drops from enemies, because they will always drop red hearts if you kill them with a hug. And there are items that the community thinks are bad, but I actually think are very good. Eve's Mascara, for example, is an item that a lot of people avoid, because if you look at it on the surface, it isn't amazing. I think this is partially due to the fact that it was worse until Repentance. It used to have your rate of fire and double your damage stat, which did not change your DPS, but it also lowered your shot speed by quite a bit, which lowered range pre-repentance. It was significantly improved, which I don't think was necessary, to only cut your fire rate by one third while still doubling damage, and shot speed no longer affects range in repentance. That means that by itself it's a 33% increase in DPS, but it also means that any other item that you have, which uses your damage stat and not your tier stat, which is a lot of items, are twice as good. That indirect damage increase that Eve's Mascara provides is so good that I think it was an above average item pre-repentance, and is now an excellent item in repentance. I really like the item because it will reward players who know what the item does, understand how it interacts with other items, and who specifically seek out items that it will synergize with. Every item has a niche in which it will be useful, which becomes very apparent if you've played this game for thousands of hours. There is a list of 45 challenges that the player can unlock and play, including all DLC challenges, that are another source of unlocks. These unlocks unlock new items, cards, pills, trinkets, all runes, and even some character upgrades, most notably Maggie starting with a special pill. The general conditions of challenges are starting with a couple items as a set character. Some challenges prevent item rooms or shops from spawning at all, and there are sometimes unique effects that are applied exclusively to a specific challenge. An example of this would be Challenge 10, Cursed, which starts the player as Maggie with Mapping, Raw Liver, Yum Heart, and Child's Heart, but the unique Curse, Curse of the Cursed, which laces the doors between rooms with spikes that harm the player one half heart every time they pass through a doorway. I like this challenge because it creates a unique scenario that would not be encountered in a normal run, and changes what items are most valuable for success. You might even consider skipping item rooms just to save health that you will need to spend to advance further through the floors. Pika Run, Cantripped, and Challenge 45 are other examples of challenges that offer a transformative experience, rather than one with either a lack of opportunities to collect items, or a couple very strong items at the beginning. Some challenges give the player a number of items, but also nerf the player in some way, usually by giving them a blindfold that prevents you from shooting tears. Challenges like this include Suicide King, Solar System, and Cat Got Your Tongue. There are many challenges that do not change the game in any interesting way though, and merely start the player with a couple themed items. Glass Cannon is a challenge that starts the player as Judas with Epic Fetus and Loki's Horns, but no item room spawns. This puts you in a dangerous position, unlike the first floor, but that would be true for any Judas run starting with Epic Fetus, which is inarguably a buff. This run is not a challenge, it's actually pretty easy so long as you're able to get a health upgrade early. I see challenges like these as merely filler, which sometimes unlock thematically related items. Unfortunately, there are a lot of challenges that follow this archetype, such as the tank, darkness falls, highbrow, slow roll, and more. There is another archetype of challenges that are just stupid, honestly. Speed, pre-repentance, the guardian, back asswords, and ultra hard are all challenges that are heavily reliant on the random items that you get. In ultra hard, you have every curse on each floor, which really just serves to make the game less fun, and hearts never spawn. No hearts existing means that taking damage becomes much more punishing, and the value of some items becomes radicalized, so much so that some of them can completely dismantle the challenge. Encountering the Book of Revelations will make Ultra Hard an order of magnitude easier than it would be without it, as it creates hearts reliably while adhering to the rule that hearts can never appear on the floor. Rather, on activation, hearts are applied directly to Isaac. That is my biggest problem with challenges. They can become trivialized when certain items appear, like Incubus showing up on a blindfolded challenge. This can also make for very exciting moments where you find the perfect item on a challenge, like finding Sacrificial Altar in the Guardian and destroying your hurt box and becoming invincible. 
but ultimately, I think that this destroys the replayability and fairness of many challenges, causing them to feel like they are gates blocking off content to the main game, rather than being supplemental content that can be enjoyed in addition to the main game. I think it's sad that out of 45 challenges in the game, there are so few challenges that make for a transformative and memorable experience that is not achievable in a normal run. Ultimately, I think that challenges are an underdeveloped design space that could have been populated with runs that either teach the player technical skills, similar to Crypt of the Necrodancer's codex, or offer alternative fun game modes, but ended up being mostly populated with filler content that you would play once and then never again. After everything has been unlocked, or if you just aren't that concerned with unlocking everything, you can still play the game to boost your win streak, play custom challenges, rank on the daily, break the game, or just do more casual runs and have a good time. I personally don't get any enjoyment out of breaking the game, which is a phrase to describe getting infinite resources and items. But I have and still do enjoy playing dailies, streaks, and just playing casually. The concept of an Isaac daily challenge is a bit unintuitive because there are so many ways to play Isaac, but I think that the modern implementation of dailies is pretty good. You are rewarded for exploring rooms, fighting enemies, collecting pickups, and killing optional bosses. You are given a score penalty for taking damage, wasting time, and a small penalty is given for every item you take. The item penalty may seem bad, but I actually like it since it means that breaking the game and getting infinite items is not encouraged, which would be a very boring way to spend every daily. I have gotten a lot of playtime out of building a win streak. My personal best streak in Afterbirth Plus was 100 consecutive wins as Eden. Playing almost any other character would be too easy for me because they always start with the very strong items that can be routinely leveraged for a lot of value. In Repentance, I've gotten over 50 wins while playing on stream as Eden. Eden streaks are an especially fun way to play the game because it requires you to play with potentially bad items. Because Eden can start with any item, you have to be able to win with bad items like Isaac's Heart if you plan on getting a triple digit streak. The fact that the continuation of a streak depends on every successive run also keeps it exciting for Isaac veterans. Eden can also start with very bad stats, which was my favorite and most memorable type of run in Afterbirth Plus, because it allows items that are low value to shine. And to bring this back to one of Isaac's greatest strengths, the game is almost infinitely replayable. Even after completing the game two times in over 2,500 hours, I still have a blast playing Isaac. You can play on your own, you can play with friends, you can play with mods, you can explore synergies and interactions with the debug menu. There are so many ways to play that the game keeps itself fresh and exciting. I don't think I'll ever see another game with this unimaginable level of replayability, and I greatly look forward to each of Edmund McMillan's future releases. The Binding of Isaac Rebirth received three paid DLCs, Afterbirth, Afterbirth Plus, and Repentance. The base game contained all of the content from the original Flash game, plus the Wrath of the Lamb DLC. The base game, Rebirth, is revered by those who play it. Afterbirth is very well liked. Afterbirth Plus got a lot of criticism at its release, but its reception changed over time and Repentance surprisingly only earned a lukewarm reception on Steam, but became very well liked over time. Afterbirth introduced many significant changes that improved the game greatly. Two new characters were added, eight new transformations were added, as well as Super Bum, Azazel's beam became able to extend with range upgrades, Eve now holds the Razor Blade, which is a huge buff allowing you to actually pick up heart containers and make use of Horv of Babylon at the same time, the method of unlocking the Lost was greatly simplified, Judas's starting item was greatly nerfed to make it more balanced, and many other items were buffed or nerfed. Notable examples of item buffs are the virus giving poisoned enemies a chance to drop a black heart, Dr. Fetus dealing significantly more damage, multiple steam sales reducing the cost of collectibles and items in shops to zero, and crack the sky light beams are more likely to hit enemies. Some notable nerfs are stopwatch only activating after you've been hit in a room, Book of Revelations and Book of Belial increasing the chance of getting a devil or angel room less than they previously did, and Head of Krampus has the chance to rotate upon use. Many new synergies were added to old items as well. The most important gameplay changes 
are Devil Rooms dynamically changing their prices so you can continue to buy items after spending all her containers, Hostile Creep despawning immediately once all enemies in a room are killed, Big Rooms give two charges to your active item, Boss Rush gives charges each wave clear, although Challenge Rooms do not, and Sacrifice Rooms being reworked to have a chance to drop an Angel item, 30 pennies, and 7 soul hearts after a certain number of sacrifices as well as guaranteeing the spawning of two angels after a set number of sacrifices. After playing the sacrifice room 12 plus times, you will have a 50% chance each time you step on the spikes to be teleported to the dark room. This is a big change because it allows players to end a run more quickly if they are strong enough to skip to the final floor, and it also provides them a means to fight Mega Satan that does not require the use of angel rooms. I really like this concept in Afterbirth and Afterbirth Plus, because in those versions of the game it was very easy to create so much health that it became difficult to lose, such as with the use of Maw of the Void or the Relic. But your damage might not be very good, so it would just bring an already won run to the end faster. However, I think that it did not serve this purpose very well many other times. If you are able to generate lots of health irregularly, such as with a Thame, you might not find an opportunity to create health on the floor the Sacrifice Room is on. Or, if your run has incredible enough damage to trivialize every room, but no way of generating more health, then the Sacrifice Room is not viable at all. I think that the item changes in this expansion, although very few, were very good. Although in some cases didn't do enough, such as with the scissors changing from a 6 room charge to a 2 room charge. The changes to the game rules are what really made this expansion excellent though. The 95 items added in Afterbirth were also pretty great. Items like Tech X and Incubus have become popular due to their obvious strength, but Car Battery, Diplopia, and Mom's Box are items that I find it hard to imagine the game without. There is a term that is thrown around after every expansion, which is item bloat, which is the idea that too many worthless items get added to the game, which makes the game worse as more items are added. I find this idea to be completely overblown and think that the item bloat is not so large as to be detrimental to the game. In this expansion, I think the only items that serve next to no practical purpose are Pay to Play, Lost Fly, Bursting Sack, and the D12. This isn't to say that they serve absolutely no purpose, but their impact on a run is so negligible that the most significant thing about them is that they take up a pedestal that could have been literally any other item. All of the other items have specific applications that can make them very good or are generally good. Just because the Wiz is an item that makes your tiers harder to hit on most runs does not mean it contributes to item bloat. Picking it up is always transformative, and if you have homing or tractor beam it can even be an excellent item. This is also true for other items like Curse of the Tower, Soy Milk, and Tiny Planet. One more huge thing that was included in Afterbirth was Greed Mode. I will dig into Greed Mode more later on, but to summarize, in this alternate game mode you spend almost the whole game in either a shop or a 2x1 room that spawns a wave of enemies after a certain amount of time passes, whether you have finished killing the current wave or not. The unique boss, Ultra Greed, is also at the end of every Greed Mode run. Afterbirth Plus was a smaller DLC at launch, but it outgrew Afterbirth by the time it received its fifth and final free content update. Significant changes brought with Afterbirth Plus include four new transformations, two new characters, special cards were given unique back sprites, restock machines can appear in shops, empty heart containers can be traded in devil rooms, and doors close if enemies are spawned with a button. There were also many item changes. Notable buffs include BFF buffing familiars that drop consumables, Fruitcake getting many good additional tier effects added to its pool, and Krampus's head no longer rotating. Many new item synergies were added as well. There were no notable item nerfs in this update. There were also many very nice quality of life changes added in Afterbirth Plus, such as pickups being able to be collected sooner after spawning, donating coins speeds up as coins are donated, Champion versions of enemies that normally do not deal contact damage no longer deal contact damage, and charges are given each wave in challenge rooms. The quality of life changes made a huge difference to someone such as myself who plays this game religiously. Conjoin's triple shot comes with a small tears and damage down, but the crowd control that it provides will almost always make it worth it, and if you can get homing or tractor beam it can be a huge upgrade. Shooting double tier sometimes is also a very nice passive from Bookworm that makes getting multiple active items not feel like a complete letdown. 
I can't say the same for the Yes Mother transformation, however, which is a shame since the majority of mom items provide minuscule benefit before repentance. The knife that follows you when you have the transformation is very hard to use to hit enemies, even when you have temporary invincibility from something like Book of Shadows. The best use for this transformation is to kill the beast in repentance, as the knife will always be pointed at the boss. In terms of item bloat, this DLC had a few more than Afterbirth. Dark Prince's crown was almost never viable, Glaucoma, Camo Undies, Brown Nugget, Angry Fly, and Fast Bombs do almost nothing. Plan C, Data Miner, and Clicker are all active items that are more likely to harm you than to help you when you use them. Bloodshot Eye and Mom's Razor are orbitals that deal almost no damage and were the only orbitals to not block enemy bullets. Adrenaline was bad in this iteration of Isaac because Red Heart builds were anti-meta. Broken Modem used to be one of my least favorite items because it causes good players to take damage by making enemies and bullets act unpredictably. And the two greatest offenders of item bloat, in my opinion, are Pop and Flatstone, which both synergize with next to no items, with Pop usually being detrimental to a run on its own. Many items that are hated by the community, such as Angry Fly, Pop, Flatstone, Fast Bombs, Broken Modem, and Buddy in a Box, were added officially to the game from mods that became popular in the Steam Workshop. I do think that the developers should have known better than to add items that provided essentially no value on most runs, such as Pop and Flatstone, but I really think that it's partially the community's fault that these items are in the game at all. Despite the item bloat, I still think that this expansion was very good. Worthless items appear rarely because of how many items there are in the game, and the quality of life improvements that came with Afterbirth Plus were so good that I had a hard time imagining how it could be improved in further expansions. Boy did I get proven wrong with Repentance. Afterbirth Plus also included a greedier mode, which I will get into in a moment. The discourse that Afterbirth Plus caused was likely due to miscommunication, as the DLC was not complete at launch. The promised item count in the advertising was not present in the game at launch. There were five content updates that would come after its initial release, the final one containing several original items and the second new character in the DLC. Before I talk about Repentance, I should talk about Greed Mode. Greed Mode is an alternative game mode where you fight all the enemies on a floor in one 2x1 room in separated waves. There is a button in the middle of the room that can be pressed to start the waves, and can be pressed while waves are spawning to temporarily stop successive waves from spawning. However, the button to stop waves from spawning costs one half heart to press. In addition to the button room with enemies, there are two item rooms, a curse room, a 2x1 shop, a secret room, an angel or devil room which is earned by fighting an additional harder boss wave, and a room containing the trapdoor to the next floor. Other than the two item rooms on each floor, the angel or devil room, and random item sources like chests, all items must be purchased from the shop using money that is awarded by clearing waves. You will receive 27 cents per floor, with items costing 15 cents, red hearts costing 3, and other pickups costing 5, assuming that there are no sales in the shop. There is also a harder version of greed mode, which is harder by awarding 5 less cents per floor making the player fight an additional wave each floor, and reducing the time between each wave spawn. The final boss of Greed Mode, Ultra Greed, also has a second phase in Greedier Mode. Unlike the hard version of standard Isaac runs, Greedier Mode must be unlocked by donating 500 cents to the Greed Donation Machine, which spawns each run after you kill Ultra Greed. I honestly really dislike the fact that Greedier must be unlocked, as it forces you to play the game mode more to even get to the point that you can start getting greedier unlocks, as beating a greedier run as a character would unlock both their greed and greedier unlockables. And the fact that you have to fill the donation machine up halfway before you can even get greedier mode means you'll probably end up having to do runs of greedier after the greed donation machine is already full, just to get the character specific unlocks. To someone like me who dislikes greed mode in concept, it feels like the game is wasting your time by holding significant unlocks that affect the normal game, such as the Lost starting with Holy Mantle or the entire character the Keeper, in a mode that is far less polished, less balanced, and more importantly, less fun. The reason I think that greed mode is so much worse than the regular game is because it is so much more linear and has less room for creative strategies. There are so many fewer things that you can interact with 
No sacrifice rooms, no libraries, no dice rooms. Secret rooms are so underwhelming and have no clear tells to their location, so it's better off to just never look for them. The lack of random room drops means that you will never have extra bombs or cards, and you may even never find the less common pickups in the whole greed mode run, such as trinkets, batteries, cards, or pills. The item pools are much less polished. For example, Glyph of Balance is in the greed mode angel item pool, but its passive effect just doesn't work at all. The mode does not play to the strengths of Isaac as a game, while simultaneously being underdeveloped in terms of its own mechanics. The mode is also especially easy to break, which I'm not sure if that's a blessing or a curse. The D20, and by extension the D-Infinity, can be used to cheese the whole game as long as you can find it. If you simply do not pick up the coins that spawn, and instead reroll them, you can turn some into chests and get infinite pickups. This is incredibly easy so long as you can get a battery to spawn in the shop. There are other incredibly imbalanced drops, such as Blank Card plus 2 of Diamonds, Steam Sale, and Counterfeit Penny, which completely throw the balance of the mode out the window. Additionally, Devil Rooms are just terrible in this mode. It's arguable whether Devil or Angel Rooms are better in the regular game, especially when considering in terms of specific characters, but in Greed Mode, I can't imagine Devil Rooms being worth it for any character that isn't one of the Losts or the Keepers. Buying items with health versus getting free items is a pretty clear choice in greed mode, especially when you will never have extra health lying around from random room drops, further showing the lack of attention given to this mode. If the devil rooms had better layouts, they could be competitive with angel rooms in terms of viability in greed mode. But as it stands, I think it is always better to take angel rooms in greed mode, excluding the two cases I previously listed. And finally, I think that ultra greed is a terrible final boss. I conceptually really like the boss, and his attacks, but he has two major problems. First is the spray of explosive coins he shoots in phase 2. They have such high shot speed and spread that they are often implausible to dodge. The second problem with Ultra Greed is his super armor. Afterbirth introduced the mechanic of super armor, which essentially reduces the extra damage that you deal to a monster, with super armor as your DPS increases. In combination, these two problems make the mandatory final boss of Greed Mode and by extension every greed mode run, heavily favor defensive builds over offensive builds. Spending money on offensive items quickly becomes diminishing returns once you become strong enough to clear the waves as they spawn. Your money becomes much better spent stocking up on heart containers or soul hearts so you can enter the ultra greed fight with as close to 12 hearts as possible, which is just really boring and incentivizes all runs to lead to a specific archetype. It is possible to become strong enough to kill Ultra Greed so quickly he doesn't have a chance to kill you, but only on runs where you already are able to create infinite money to buy a ridiculous number of items, and in that case you would have already had 12 hearts anyways. All this is to say that I don't like Greed Mode, and I personally think that it is the game's biggest flaw. As a silver lining to that, once you've gotten all the unlocks from Greedier Mode, the flaws of the game mode become irrelevant as there is no more incentive to play the mode. Finally, we've made it to Repentance, the final Isaac DLC which came out on March 31st, 2021. This DLC was huge, monumental even. It added 169 new items, many of which work together to create completely new archetypes for effects, such as wisps, ice tears, pedestals that cycle through items, and item quality. The two biggest heaps of content added to the game are the new routes that a run can take and the new characters. As was previously mentioned, in addition to ending a run on the chest, the dark room, or the void, in Repentance you can now end a run by going to the new floors, the corpse, or home as well. These new floors add so much new content to the game, through the new enemies on them, new mechanics that you can interface with on them, and the side quest to get the knife pieces. The new floors have integrated themselves so seamlessly with the game, and there is an actual incentive to go to the floors on runs where you aren't trying to kill Mother, the boss that's on the corpse. Obviously you have to go to the alternate floors to get the knife pieces when you are trying to kill Mother, but even if you don't go for the knife pieces, the item rooms on the alternate path will always have two items to choose from, one of them always being blind, making for an interesting choice when a visible item is an item that the player thinks is okay, but not amazing. On top of that, in the alternate basement floor, Downpour, you're given the opportunity to get a second boss item. However, to get this item, you need to beat the boss on that floor an additional time as the Lost. I really like this mechanic, as it rewards players for perfecting the bosses on that floor, 
as well as offering them an interesting choice. Unfortunately, the mines do not offer as many unique scenarios to the player. While still offering item rooms with an additional blind item and the second knife piece, there is not another opportunity to get an extra boss item or anything like that. Unless... I still frequently go to this floor because of an interesting mechanic that I only recently became aware of. Because the alternate path floors are always one floor behind their regular counterpart, Basement 2 will lead to Downpour 2, and if you go back to normal floors after that, you will be taken to Caves 2, which leads to Mines 2, and so on. This can be exploited to get a boss challenge room every floor, because boss challenge rooms only spawn on floors that end with a 2, which in Repentance will always contain a boss item. Exploiting this allows players to get an extra boss item each floor, so long as they can find a way into the room. And finally, there's Mausoleum. Going to the Mausoleum is a major risk reward, as the enemies and rooms are much more difficult than on the depths, but because Mausoleum 2 replaces Room 1, you get an extra item room and shop, as well as boss trap room, as previously explained. I think this floor makes the most interesting argument for and against it. You have to pay two hearts to get into the Mausoleum, but you get an extra item room and shop, but the enemies are much harder, but because Mausoleum 2 replaces Room 1, you delay taking full heart damage each hit for another floor. In short, the alternate path floors are very well designed, offering interesting decisions and compelling reasons to visit them, even at the inherent cost of doing so. Now the characters that were added to Repentance are what really blew everyone away once they realized the truth. Only two characters were advertised to be in Repentance, being Bethany and Jacob and Esau. But as a total surprise, there was an alternate version of every character added as well. Repentance more than doubled the number of characters in Isaac, taking it from 15 to 34. The alternate characters, called Tainted Characters, are unlocked by going to the Beast and opening a secret door. They all have completely separate post-it notes from their non-tainted counterparts, and often have very transformative mechanics that are new to the game. For example, one of my favorite Tainted Characters, Tainted Isaac, has two options to choose from whenever an item spawns. However, he can only hold eight items at once and chooses what items to drop through an item HUD in the top left of the screen. This changes the player's strategy and possible win conditions. Collecting lots of mediocre items is no longer enough to win. You now need high value items to fill your inventory slots. It also puts a lot of value on items that can give you theoretically infinite stats, like Candy Heart, Soul Locket, or Immaculate Conception all of which give you upgrades for collecting consumables. An aspect of Repentance that is especially prominent in the new characters that I've not seen anyone else talk about is the fact that Isaac has become much more gamified in this update. Something I have always liked about Isaac is the lack of in-game menus. This came at a cost, of course. For example, the lack of game menus meant that when playing slot machines, you would always have to go one penny at a time, which usually is annoying enough to completely remove the incentive of spending money on them in the first place. An example of another game that tried to maintain this philosophy is Undertale. In what I perceive as an effort to keep the game as an immersive experience, Toby Fox kept the number of gameplay settings to a minimum. There is no text speed setting, or music or sound sliders. And what I am most disappointed with is that there is no boss rush. The lack of a boss rush is evidence for me that Undertale stuck to this philosophy so closely as to harm itself. The combat and boss fights in that game are so much fun and real highlights of the entire game, but to experience any of them again, you would need to replay the whole game. This is especially unfortunate for the bosses locked behind the genocide route, as you would need to go through hours of grinding and walking just to get to those two boss fights again. Luckily, I think Isaac has reached a much more balanced pursuit of this design philosophy. Upon initial release, the lack of menus meant that the game was simple to learn, despite being hard to master. Anyone could pick up and play the game with the simple instructions of move, shoot, and collect pickups. Menus and additional UI get in the way of this, and I'm sure Edmund thought the same thing, because he was against showing the actual player stats when the game initially released. Instead, we only had the highly inaccurate tick marks for stats on the pause menu. And the fact that the player had no item inventory with limited space kept them from wasting time in any menus. Everything is interactable with in the overworld. Obviously, the decision to keep the number of UI elements and menus to a minimum was changed as a response to what the players wanted, again showing that Edmund has really committed to this game belonging to the fans. New Repentance characters Tainted Isaac, Tainted Cain, and Tainted Blue Baby defy this previous sensibility, and that is okay. The game is still simple to learn, and a casual won't even encounter any of the Tainted characters for dozens if not hundreds of hours of gameplay. 
Because elements like this were left unexplored for so long, these new characters that take advantage of extra UI feel so fresh and had plenty of design space for transformative gameplay. And honestly, now that the ice has been broken, I would like it if a couple more menus could be added to the game, like for gambling or backtracking. Not all of the tainted characters change the game so fundamentally though. Tainted Apollyon being the least transformative character by turning items into launchable attack fly familiars. I actually don't like all of the tainted characters, Tainted Jacob, Tainted Samson, and Tainted Blue Baby being my least favorite. But honestly, it makes sense that not all the characters would appeal to everyone, with so many of them being so different and sometimes fundamentally changing how the game is played. Except for Tainted Jacob, I unironically think he is objectively bad and no one who has completed his post-it notes enjoys playing as him. These new characters add so much new content to the game. I was so happy to see the content in the game open up in the way it did after I unlocked my first Tainted character. Their inclusion adds hundreds of hours of playtime to the game alone, and the new unlockables are also so much fun. Soul Stones, Inverse Cards, New Beggars, and the Crane game are really fun and interesting new objects to interact with, adding a lot of flavor to the runs, regardless of if you find any of the new items on them or not. Some other major improvements and reworks that Repentance brought are new sprites for enemies, item rebalances, item quality and weight, better angel rooms, complete multiplayer, and reworked red heart damage conditions. There are plenty of notable buffs and nerfs to items in Repentance. A buff that I think is amazing is an added familiar chain priority list given to all familiars. This priority list changes the order of your familiars dynamically. Previously, the first familiar you got would be the first in your chain, the second familiar would be the behind the first, and so on. But Repentance reworked it to give Incubus the highest priority to be first in your familiar chain, Lil Brim the second most priority, all shooting familiars share the third most priority, and non-attacking familiars all have the least priority. This is so great because it encourages the player to interact with more familiar items. Previously, it would sometimes be better to not take a free weak familiar, such as Brother Bobby, because that would mean that if you got a good familiar later, like Incubus or Little Brim, it would be further back in your familiar chain. Lilith's Incubus also has been made unique, and Incubus now actually uses the player's range and shot speed stats, as well as now being compatible with items like Dead Eye when it previously was not. On top of the familiar chain buff, most shooting familiars were buffed to shoot significantly more frequently, and familiars that follow the player were buffed to have a smaller delay behind Isaac. There were also a couple nerfs, such as Incubus and Lil Brim now both being weaker. Honestly, I think that these nerfs were as needed as the buffs. I have a video uploaded where I beat an entire Isaac run where the only item I pick up is Lil Brim. He was clearly overpowered pre-repentance. There were many nerfs to orbital familiars as well, with most defensive orbitals having their hitbox and damage ticks per second reduced, and their rotation speed increased. This is good because orbitals were extremely overpowered, being able to kill bosses solely on their own. Cube of Meat, an extremely common item, was previously so powerful that it would often out-damage your actual tiers. Grounded familiars that would lock onto enemies and attack, like level 3 plus Meat Boy, were also buffed to have better pathfinding making an actually compelling case to lose a level 2 cube of meat for a higher level meat boy. And if the player ever gets 3 orbitals at once pre-repentance, which was as simple as getting 3 pretty flies, their previously larger size used to make it almost impossible to be hit by bullets. Reducing their size makes the game better by preventing the player from becoming so safe that victory is already guaranteed, and they have to go through the unengaging process of walking through the rest of the floors to claim their victory. These familiar changes were one of my favorites, making an entire category of items that were fun, but very weak, to be strong enough to hold actual value past the early game. Another general item change made in Repentance is the removal of special items, and the introduction of specific item weights. Previously, there was a list of special items, which, once one was found, would make it significantly less likely for you to encounter more in the future. The items were mostly either tier modifiers that did not work well with one another, or especially powerful items. This system was replaced in Repentance with items with automatically decreased weight. Item weight already existed pre-Repentance, but every item, to my knowledge, other than Delirious and Mega Blast, started with a weight of 1. Each time the item is seen, its weight will go down, and if it were to be picked up, its weight is reduced to 0. As an item's weight goes down, it becomes less likely to appear 
and if it reaches zero, it cannot appear again, unless it drops from a few specific means, such as the items dropped by many bosses. Repentance gave some items lower item weight by default, making them much less likely to appear as compared to other items in their pool. For example, the item blank card has a weight of 0.2 in specifically the shop pool, making it 80% less likely to show up than any of the other items that have a starting weight of 1 in the shop. I think this new system is more intuitive than special items, especially since almost all of the tier modifier items in the special item list have all been given synergies with one another. However, I think the specific example of blank card is a microcosm of some of the design problems I have with some of the changes in Repentance. Blank card was an extremely strong item, so it made sense to make it less common in the shop pool, but it was also nerfed in Repentance to have a longer or shorter charge time to match the last card you used it on. Both of these changes together make the item significantly less common and also make it much less notable in terms of power. Either of these nerfs would be appropriate, but both at the same time was an overcorrection. Another example of this that has a significant impact on every run is the general nerf to shops as a whole. Reducing the weight of some of the best items in the shop pool is one thing, but when you stack that on top of the chance to get shops with fewer collectibles, and, at launch, the removal of shop restock boxes, they were nerfed so hard as to become irrelevant on many runs. This combined with the already existing chance of greed to spawn in place of up to two shops causes the player to end up with a large number of extra coins at the end of many runs with no way to spend them which removes the incentive of exploring and leveraging items and pickups to get more money. Any one of these nerfs would have been fine, as restock boxes being present in most shops was way too strong, but all of them together ended up making shops have a minimal impact on a lot of runs. Devil rooms are another mechanic that was nerfed too much, in my opinion. Red hearts are much better in Repentance, which I love. It makes another archetype of run completely viable. However, it makes it much harder to justify paying for devil deals. With the ability to get a guaranteed angel room by skipping the first devil room, better angel rooms, some devil items becoming more expensive, and the nerf to devil items that could give black hearts, such as Athame, Mob the Void, and Abaddon, as well as the introduction of and accumulation of lower value devil items, such as Blood Oath, True Spooky, Ouija Board, The Quarter, and A Pound of Flesh, and worse layouts, devil rooms are generally just worse than angel rooms. I love that angel rooms were made viable, and I think the value between angel and devil rooms is much more balanced than it ever has been, but it still feels like they overcompensated when making angel rooms more attractive. And despite my praise earlier about the needed nerfs to orbitals, I do think that specifically cube of meat and ball of bandages were nerfed too hard. The items are so common, probably being the most common non-story item that I see on runs, but are not of almost any note anymore. Reducing the size of their hitbox was necessary, and they did used to deal too much damage, but reducing their damage tick speed as well as their damage per tick that they deal is another example of making multiple nerfs at once when just one would have been sufficient. And finally, I think the mechanic that unjustly suffered the most in Repentance is the full run reroll. The D4 and D100 were very, very powerful pre-Repentance, essentially being a one run on any run as long as you were smart about when you rerolled. But the entire run reroll mechanic was nerfed far too heavily. Items that provided heart containers now remove their heart containers when re-rolled. Items that give consumables on pickup, including red and soul hearts, no longer do so, turning items like pyro and skeleton key into completely dead items when re-rolled into. And re-rolling items that count towards a transformation now removes the credit towards that transformation, and even removes completed transformations. Removing heart containers when the corresponding health up item is removed makes sense. As before Repentance, the D4 and D100 would usually be able to give you significantly more health per reroll than would be reasonable to lose in 6 rooms. But this mechanic has the infuriating side effect of reducing the amount of effective health ups you have. If you have 5 filled red hearts and 1 soul heart, then reroll and don't reroll into any health ups, you'll be reduced to just 1 soul heart. And if you reroll again into 5 items that give heart containers, they will all be empty. You might think that this makes red heart builds bad with the d4, but soul heart builds can get even more screwed. If you have 12 soul hearts and reroll your run into 6 items that give heart containers, 6 of your soul hearts will be pushed out of your health pool, giving you a total of 6 soul hearts and 6 empty red heart containers. Using full run rerolls used to give you runs of varying quality, with an upward trend as you would accrue items that give you consumables on pickup as well as transformations. Now repeated use of run rerolls gives you a downward trend, as items can reroll into dead items that only give bonuses if you were to pick them up off a pedestal, 
your heart containers are emptied, your soul hearts pushed out, and your carefully selected items are rerolled haphazardly into potentially worse items. As a result of this change, die rooms with 1 or 6 pips, the D4, D100, and the new Inverse Wheel of Fortune card are inadvisable unless you have some terrible combination of items with anti-synergy, such as Dr. Fetus plus My Reflection or Trisagon plus Ipecac. Despite these problems though, the vast majority of changes have been for the best, and I'm amazed that Repentance was able to improve the game as a whole so much. I don't even think that setting items with lower initial weight is necessarily bad. It exists as a means to make some items rarer while still keeping them in common pools like boss or item room. But I do think that the reasoning behind some of the weights is strange. For example, Void has a weight of 0.5 in the Angel Pool, with that being the only item pool it's in while Godhead and Sacred Heart both have a weight of 1 in the Angel Pool. Is this implying that Void is more powerful or transformative than those items? The fact that the Angel Pool is the only item pool that Void appears in makes me think that that is what the weight is implying, which is very strange, because outside of very specific active item combinations, Sacred Heart is clearly stronger and more consequential than Void. My only other guess as to why it would have reduced weight would be to make Apollyon more unique as his item will appear less often for other characters. However, other character starting items like Yumheart have a weight of 1 in their pools, so I don't think that this is the case. And if shops as a whole weren't nerfed so hard, I would be a fan of Blank Card having reduced weight, making it more of a secret room item that can occasionally appear in shops, so as not to make it quite so rare. To backtrack to individual item buffs and nerfs, there are so many changes that have significantly made an item better or less broken, which has made runs much more balanced. Changes that have been made to a number of items are health ups, also healing an empty heart container if you have one, mom range ups have secondary effects now, many items have had their necessary charge ticks reduced, some items got dynamic charge ticks, and a few items have had their use animation shortened. There are also many changes intrinsic to specific items, such as soy milk greatly reducing knockback, black heart generation on enemy death is now exclusive to serpent's kiss, removed from a theme, maw of the void and the virus. Aquarius's creep inheriting tier effects, Satanic Bible replacing boss items with paid devil room items, Converter transforming soul hearts to red hearts at a 1 to 1 rate, Glyph of Balance affecting room clear drops in addition to champion drops, Holy Water creating petrifying creep, Deep Pockets increasing the max coin counter and spawning coins from runes that don't drop anything, Shard of Glass draining HP and in exchange creating many blood tears from Isaac's body, and many more. I've seen outcry over some of these nerfs, such as decreasing damage from Succubus, Sharpstraw no longer dropping half soul hearts, Brimstone dealing less damage, and especially 2020 decreasing your damage. But I think that most of these nerfs make the items less polarizing and for a better overall game experience. It should help to remember that in exchange for these nerfs, other items were made better. I actually made a tier list for all Afterbirth Plus items the night before Repentance was released. And now, 600 hours of Repentance playtime later, I've made a Repentance All Items tier list. I'll link a post with both full tier lists in the description, but from analyzing the tier lists, I have some insightful information about the general item quality. The number of bad items in the game actually decreased by 35, despite 169 new items being added to the total item tally. This means that the percentage of bad items out of all items in the game was cut from 22.1% to 12.1%. And since that percentage has to go somewhere else, the number of items that offer small but noticeable upgrades increased from 32% of all items to 42.2% of all items. The percentage of items that add very significant upgrades and items that give very small upgrades have both also stayed almost exactly the same, meaning that the pool of all items is just stronger now. I really think that the people complaining that there were too many item nerfs are missing the point. The rework for Red Heart damage has also made the game easier, or at least removed a bit of tedium. Red Heart damage is when you take damage from enemies or hazards before defeating the boss on the floor. Avoiding Red Heart damage is a key part of the Isaac meta, because if you take Red Heart damage, your chance of getting a Devil or Angel room on that floor is reduced by 2 thirds, or 99% if you take Red Heart damage in the boss room. The rework has made it so that Curse Room spikes, Sacrifice Room spikes, and Mimic Chest spikes no longer count as red heart damage. This allows players to interact with these objects before fighting the boss, even if they had no soul hearts, which reduces the necessary amount of backtracking on the average floor. This is a great change, but it is far from fixing the whole problem of backtracking in Isaac, which I'll get into later. 
Another very exciting rework in Repentance is True Co-op. Before Repentance, Isaac was multiplayer, but extra players were relegated to play as co-op babies, which are familiar-like babies that share all of Player 1's stats, deal half of Player 1's damage, take health from Player 1 to join, cannot pick up items or consumables, and sometimes will have unique effects. This co-op was better than nothing, but it felt inconsequential to be a co-op baby, since you can continually die and respawn as long as Player 1 has more HP, and you couldn't pick anything up or move through rooms. Or, sometimes it could have the opposite problem. The co-op babies could be too strong, making the game virtually unlosable. The black, blue, and red baby all spawn with an additional free heart, which replenishes when leaving and rejoining, meaning that damage taken by the baby can be immediately recovered if they drop out, then rejoin. O Baby is just a simpler version of this, being a baby that is immune to damage. These babies offer exploits that are simply just boring, allowing player 2 to infinitely use interactables that take away player health. Colorful Baby is the most broken baby though, completely refilling all heart containers upon joining. By simply dropping out then rejoining whenever damage is taken, it is impossible to die, so long as player 1 has multiple red heart containers. I'm not against co-op babies having special helpful abilities, and I think Blinding Baby is the perfect example of how Colorful Baby should have worked. When Blinding Baby dies, a Sun card is activated, damaging all enemies in the room and refilling all heart containers. But because co-op babies that have special effects are lost for the rest of the run when they die, this effect can only be activated once. This gives the player an additional tool to use and leverage without making the game completely trivial. There are many other babies that do have cool effects, but I'm focusing on the negative ones here, because when I've played multiplayer and these babies that had game-breaking secondary effects showed up, using them to their full potential would just make the game no longer fun. The babies with neat additional effects, like an innate pretty fly or a tear effect, were neat and you loved to see them as player too, but they were not transformative to the run as a whole, and were often a bit underwhelming. In short, the co-op baby multiplayer in Isaac is underwhelming and can ruin the game balance if you get one of the overpowered co-op babies. But like I said earlier, Repentance added True Co-op. True Co-op allows up to four players to join at the start of a run. Each player can play as any of the 34 standard characters that have been unlocked, and each player has as much control as player one. Players each have their own individual items, can collect pickups, can use bombs and keys, travel through doors, and have individual active items, trinkets, and card slots. An extra boss item spawns every floor for each additional player as well, to somewhat counter the loss of power when dividing items up among the different players. Rather than taking health from player 1 to join, true co-op players must join the game in the first room, when they will spawn with their selected character starting stats and items. If a co-op player dies, they will become a ghost that deals minimal damage and has no items until the boss room is cleared, upon which they will be revived with one half heart and all collectibles intact. This form of co-op is much more fun because it makes the other player's actions relevant, allows for different builds between different characters, and is just more intuitive and fun. I've played a lot of this co-op in Repentance, and it is a new and fun experience that builds upon the fun of the normal game. It works great, and is my favorite way to play the game lately. My biggest complaint with the feature is that there is not a packaged way to play it online. You can play it online using Steam Remote Play, or I personally use the app Parsec to play online, but these methods are not perfect causing occasional stuttering and frame drops for the client player. There's technically a way you can play it online by editing the game's files, but this feature is not finished at the time of this recording, and there has been no word about its potential official release. There's also the secret Possessor mode, which is a versus multiplayer mode. In this mode, player 2 controls one monster at a time in each room, even taking control of bosses. Specific attacks are mapped to different buttons, and the enemies control very similar to how charmed enemies from the Friend Finder item control. Unfortunately, at the time of this recording, this mode is also unfinished. Not all enemies are actually controllable, many bosses being examples of such. I played a bit of this mode near the initial release of Repentance, and my biggest complaint with it is that the balance is pretty skewed in the early and late game. In the early game, enemies have a big advantage, as many enemies become significantly faster when possessed. And in combination with other groups of enemies, a possessor can create nearly undodgeable group attacks. But later in the game, the player becomes strong enough to easily kill any single enemy, making it much more in favor of the player. The fact that many rooms in the last two floors contain bosses that cannot be controlled by the possessor also contributes to the possessor being weaker in the late game. 
This mode is super cool, even though it's unfinished, and I hope that we get to see a finished release of it in the future. Thirty-four characters is a lot. With so many characters, there are a lot of unique mechanics that are emphasized on them to encourage different strategies. I'll get straight into giving a short synopsis on each character archetype and what I think they add to the game, as well as problems with individual characters. The characters that don't have anything interesting going on with them, other than higher starting stats, are the ones that I would hardly notice if they were gone. I liked them when I was an intermediate level player because of their innately higher stats, especially their damage multipliers, but I don't see much reason to play as them if you don't struggle with finding enough items to get adequate damage. Lazarus is at least somewhat unique in being able to leverage Devil Rooms much more than other characters by getting a free health up each floor if you're willing to go down to zero red hearts, which obviously synergizes great with Devil Rooms. These characters are all pretty normal, while having just enough personality to stand out. There aren't any huge strengths that they have that you can abuse. Unfortunately, I have some gripes with Eve, Tainted Samson, and Lilith. Eve's damage multiplier is reduced to 75% when she isn't in the Whore of Babylon state, which can be very punishing if you drop the Razor Blade and aren't able to get enough devil deals. I think she would be a much better character if Razor Blade were a pocket active for her, but that mechanic was reserved for Tainted characters which is also the problem that I have with Tainted Samson. Tainted Samson has Berserk as a passive effect that automatically triggers rather than being an active effect. I think that this is a huge detriment to him because there are a lot of runs where being in Berserk is just not as fun or as powerful as shooting tears, disregarding the fact that it can cause you to take a lot of damage. This can be a major annoyance on runs that have a lot of cool tier effects, which suddenly all become inert once you go Berserk and get the Bone Club. I think he would have been a much more fun character if he had Berserk as a pocket active, rather than a passive effect that automatically triggers. And to continue this trend, I think that Lilith would be a better character if she had a pocket active. Box of Friends is a fun item to have as her that is unfortunately not all that great. Because it fits her character so well, I think it would have been appropriate for her to have it as a pocket active. As the way it is right now, it usually ends up getting dropped as soon as a good active item shows up. Also, sometimes clearing rooms as her can be very obnoxious when the enemies chase you, especially in rooms with stone fatties. The other characters in this category I think are the most fun in the game, because they're unique without their gimmicks overpowering the flavor of every run you play as them. These characters are all more or less only unique because of the starting item that they have. I think it's fine to have characters that have nothing going on for them other than their starting item, as long as it's transformative which is true for all of these characters, except maybe Maggie. I give her a pass though, because she conveniently acts as a crutch for beginner players who do not yet know the enemy attack patterns. I also find it thematically appropriate that Isaac's starting item is the D6, as that is the item that best represents the game's identity as a whole. These characters also are some of my favorites out of the whole bunch. There are a few close range characters in the game. Unfortunately, I think what makes these characters unique is largely overshadowed by the fact that melee doesn't play well with many of the items in the game. Shot speed does essentially nothing for any of them, range is not a high value stat on the Forgotten or Tainted Lilith, and Tainted Lilith is not able to make much use out of any tier effects. As a diversion, I think that these characters were a neat inclusion, but I don't end up playing as them often. The challenge characters are an archetype that ended up being a mixed bag for me. Most of them I think serve as an appropriate challenge to the player at the point that they unlock them, but Tainted Blue Baby and Tainted Jacob I have major problems with. Tainted Blue Baby has worse tears, damage, and speed than regular Blue Baby, does not have the Devil Room and Fly Poop perks from the normal Blue Baby, and additionally he can't use bombs. His unique poop mechanic allows him to blow things up and he can leverage it to deal damage, but my problem with it is that it is cumbersome and doesn't scale well. By the time you reach the end game of a run, your tiers are likely strong enough that it would be smarter to just focus on shooting and dodging rather than dealing flat damage with his poops. Tainted Jacob is an ordeal in himself. He used to be my least favorite character due to the fact that Shadow Esau had limited health and it was often impossible to not kill him by accident on the later floors of the game, which would turn you into the Lost with no mantle, just like if you were touched by him. The game is not made to be played as the Lost with no mantle, 
and this is especially true on the later floors. Doing so will lead to deeply unsatisfying deaths to things like spike rocks, exploding boom flies, and mushrooms that are near doors, or even a rare undodgeable attack like Krampus' rotating brimstone beam near a wall. Now after all the buffs tainted Jacob got, he's okay, but still my least favorite character by a wide margin. His entire gimmick makes the game worse. Tainted Jacob is at his best when his defining characteristic, Shadow Esau, is either completely nullified or removed. An item like Sharp Plug can make it so you can keep Esau almost indefinitely chained, and before Tainted Jacob's buffs, items like Eraser and Cleaver could remove Esau from a run or floor relatively easily. These items are and were very exciting to find because they essentially changed Tainted Jacob into Isaac with Anima Sola, which is a very strong but boring item. And if that doesn't explain how, as a character, he is conceptually flawed, then I don't know what will. And my personal favorite character is Tainted Lazarus. When I'm playing casually, he's the character I play as the most. I find the argument that he's a bad character because each half of the character gets less items to be uncompelling. What's the point of knowing how to take advantage of the items and interactables of the game if you're never pushed to use those skills? Because his gimmick isn't simply having 2 or 3 max HP, which would completely invalidate many items and strategies related to health, and his gameplay loop is for the most part the same as a regular character's but just harder, I think he makes the ideal endgame character to play as for fun. To be honest, I wish that he were a bit weaker. Getting doubled item devil and angel rooms in shops makes up for most of the shortcomings of having to split item among two characters. Last are the zany characters. These characters are all extremely transformative, which makes them polarizing to players. My biggest problem with these characters is that because they are so different, they have obvious game breaks. Tainted Maggie is balanced egregiously, as the Habit or Sharp Plug are both essentially single item game breaks for her that make her unkillable, which is just the fastest way to suck all fun out of the game for me. Tainted Kane is pretty fun post nerf. He used to be the strongest character by multiple orders of magnitude, as you could completely forfeit any potential fun to be found in the run, as well as any sort of respect you had for yourself and the game, by crafting Rock Bottom, Red Stew, and Soy Milk on Basement 1 to eliminate the need to even engage with his mechanics or any other items beyond that point. With randomized recipes, he's still pretty fun, although a very slow character. Tainted Eden suffers greatly from the way full run rerolls were reworked. Like with the D4 or D100, you can reroll out of several heart containers at once, leading to deaths that may feel unfair. Additionally, I think that rerolling your trinket, active, and card slots on hit are a really cool mechanic that is unique to him. But since the update that made self damage not reroll Tainted Eden, intentional use of this mechanic has become much, much less applicable. I really wish that self damage still would reroll him, as fishing for a better card with persisting effects, such as Inverse Hierophant, is a mechanic that no other character has access to. Jacob and Esau are a character that I think adds nothing to the game. It is implausible to dodge all attacks when playing as Jacob and Esau. I do not find it fun to be forced to take damage because their hitbox is so large, and some puzzle rooms, especially the ones with tractor beam maws, are an absolute nightmare for them. They offer very few interesting decisions or mechanics, aside from having twice as much room to hold active items, trinkets, and cards or pills. They seem like they were included in Anti-Birth just as a tech demo, and as a result had to be included in Repentance, or else players would feel like they were scammed out of content that was in the original mod. Jacob and Esau are simply a less mechanically driven version of Tainted Lazarus, whose increased difficulty actually feels fair. Tainted Eve and Bethany are just too strong. I hope that they, as well as Tainted Maggie, all get nerfed in the future, as it's incredibly easy to become an unstoppable force as all of those characters. But overall, I'm happy with the zany characters, as they are very transformative and change your perspective on each run. If I came off as negative when talking about the characters in this game, that's only because I don't have time to talk about all the things I like about them in this video. Repentance has been, by far, the most transformative DLC that Rebirth has received, changing the way that the game is played by adding new viable endings, extremely transformative characters that redefine their own clear conditions, mechanical changes that affect entire archetypes of items, tweaked game balance, as well as a huge number of new monsters, items, and trinkets. Despite the flaws that I have outlined previously, 
I cannot overstate that this game is incredible, and there's never been a better time to play Isaac. However, throughout all versions of Rebirth, there have been two big problems with the game that have never been addressed. Curses and backtracking. Curses are a modifier for a floor that hinders the player in some way. There are six curses. Curse of the Labyrinth, Curse of the Unknown, Curse of the Blind, Curse of Darkness, Curse of the Maze, and Curse of the Lost. My favorite, and probably the favorite of most players, is Curse of the Labyrinth. This curse combines two floors into one, containing two boss rooms, two item rooms, and more than two times as many standard rooms as a normal floor would have. It can only contain up to one of any other special room, such as shops, curse rooms, sacrifice rooms, etc. This curse is not bad or good, as these factors give it advantages and disadvantages. The worst part of one of these XL floors is that there can only be one devil or angel room on it, as opposed to two chances to get one from two separate floors. But after an XL floor, you'll have a 33% higher chance to get one on the next floor, as compared to a standard one. The larger floor size also gives the player much more inventory space. Finding a valuable tool that cannot be taken with you to future floors, such as a sacrifice room, will allow the player more time to collect resources to use on it. This is not just relevant to specific kinds of rooms, but can also be used to better use other tools available like cards and runes on the floor. And if you have mapping on the floor, you can get through an XL floor significantly faster than you'd be able to clear two individual floors making Curse of the Labyrinth desirable if you are trying to go as fast as possible. Calling this floor modifier a curse is a bit of a misnomer in my opinion, but the other curses are not as helpful. Curse of the Unknown makes the player's health invisible, making decisions that require the spending of health potentially more risky. What I like about this curse is how it makes relevant the small detail that if Isaac enters a room with one half heart of health, he will pee on the floor. The thing that I don't like about this curse is that it makes sacrifice rooms and any other way that you leverage your HP much less appealing, as you need to sacrifice many hearts to get good rewards from a sac room, and you need to go through your soul hearts first, making the precise amount of HP that you have when deciding to use a sacrifice room much more relevant. Curse of the Blind, similar to Curse of the Unknown, takes information away from the player, forcing them to make less informed decisions that may carry risk. This curse causes all item pedestals on the floor to show only a question mark, which prevents the player from knowing what item the pedestal holds until it is picked up. This causes situations where a player will pick up an item they would not normally want to take and force them to play with it. This can sometimes be a death sentence, like if you have Trisagon and then pick up a blind Ipecac, but it can also show the player that items they previously thought were bad actually have a use through forced experimentation, like a blind Isaac's heart. For experienced players who are trying to get a high win streak, this curse means they will have to skip items that could be bad, such as blind item room items. Previously, I thought that this was bad for streaks, but in Repentance, a consolation was added for players who skip blind item rooms in the chance to get a planetarium room on a later floor. I think that this curse adds to the game by forcing newer players to take items they don't see the value of, but I think that it takes away from the game for the more experienced players. Curse of Darkness makes the rooms much darker. There is honestly not much to say about this curse. It can make specific enemies very difficult to predict and dodge, sometimes feeling unfair, but usually has next to no impact on a run. A neat detail about this curse highlights that some items glow and can increase the player's vision radius, such as hot bombs. Other than that, this curse is mostly irrelevant, with the worst thing about it being that it doesn't change the gameplay or the player's strategy at all unless you're playing in a bright environment, such as outside on a 3DS or Switch, in which case it literally just makes it hard to see anything on your screen, which isn't fun. I was mostly positive about the first three curses, but I think that the remaining two curses actually take away from the game and make it less fun. Curse of the Maze trolls the player by shuffling rooms around during room transitions, and sometimes Isaac is shuffled as well. Before Repentance, this curse was much more annoying, but luckily now it can only send the player to rooms that they have not cleared before. This makes the curse better by making it affect the player less often, which I think just shows that the game would be better off without it. Finally, the worst curse in the game is Curse of the Lost. This curse, like Curse of the Unknown and Blind, takes away information from the player, this particular one removing the player's minimap. This curse is so much worse than the others because it does not increase risk, 
change the player's strategy, or force the player to make any interesting decisions. It just causes the player to get easily lost, makes backtracking more annoying, and wastes the player's time. The only conceivable way that this could affect gameplay is that it can slow the player down if they're trying to make it to boss rush or hush, simply by wasting the player's time. This curse is not fun and is not salvageable in its current form. The game would be better without this curse, or if it were given a complete overhaul. If Curse of the Lost had to stay in the game, I think the best solution would be to still have a minimap, but make it update in a way that is not linear with the rooms that the player explores, just like the minimap in the April Fool's Challenge. There are also two pills that give the player effects identical to curses, allowing for an unholy combination of curses on a single floor. Amnesia gives the player Curse of the Lost, and Question Marks gives the player Curse of the Maze. It's already bad enough that the two worst curses can be given to the player through pills, but the fact that they can stack is unholy. When you have no minimap and are teleported to random rooms on the floor, that is just disorienting and not fun. And since these effects can both be triggered on a floor with another curse, if gotten on an XL floor from Curse of the Labyrinth, the effect is made exponentially worse. Even simply getting the Curse of the Lost on a giant floor like the Void is bad enough to seriously taint the player's enjoyment at the end of a run. The game would simply be better without these pills, and if the Void floor was immune to getting Curse of the Lost. There have been no new curses added to the game since Rebirth, and I honestly think that the game would be improved if curses in their current state were removed from the game entirely. But despite that, I do not think that the concept of curses is inherently anti-fun. A curse that I think could be fun, and would actually challenge the player without making the game more tedious, would be a curse that prevents hearts from naturally dropping from room clears on that floor. Or there could be a curse that makes champions more common. There's still room for new curses to do things other than remove access to parts of the UI, and I would love if these were taken advantage of and used as an opportunity to replace Curse of the Lost. Backtracking is the other big problem that I think Isaac has. Similar to the roguelite Spelunky, Isaac can only hold one usable pickup, be it card, rune, or pill, at a time. This means you have to make decisions about what you want to take with you to future floors, but it also means that moving collectibles between rooms can be a huge hassle. If you want to put every card and pill into one room to reroll them all at once with a d20, that can take a lot of time, and is just boring. That's not the only example of tedious backtracking, but it was the most annoying one I could think of. There are many situations where it is optimal to travel back and forth between rooms to get more use out of active effects and your resources. A more common example of backtracking is backtracking to get red hearts to feed to a blood donation machine or a demon beggar when you have very few red heart containers, so you can only hold a couple red hearts at a time. The one interesting aspect about backtracking is that in dailies, it causes the player to make tactical decisions about what is and is not worth going back for as on daily challenges you want to clear as many rooms and gather as many collectibles as possible, while still making it to boss rush and hush. However, this definitely does not make up for the annoyance that it adds to literally every other run. There is a mod called Good Trip that allows you to teleport Isaac to any room that has been explored and cleared while he is not in combat. I've played with it a lot, and honestly, I think something like this is a great solution. It makes collecting red hearts and other backtracking ventures painless. There are some ways to use it to do things that would be normally impossible, like traveling between rooms on opposite ends of the floor without a series of cleared rooms connecting them. But if it were to be officially added to the game, I think it would be accepted with open arms by the players for removing the largest source of tedium in the game, and I will continue to play with the mod whenever I'm not doing dailies. Monster design is something that I think is very well done for the vast majority of the enemies in the game. I do, however, have some grievances with a few of the enemies. I hate lumps. Please at least remove them from big rooms. They can run away and just waste your time while you're trying to kill them. There's a mod called Lump Fix that adds a cooldown of just a second to their teleport, and I'm amazed that something like this isn't in the game already. It's such a quick fix to these often annoying enemies. Carry On Queen makes the game worse by simply being annoying to kill. If you don't have piercing or alternative means of dealing damage, fighting her just isn't fun. Twitchy, poofers, and viz fatties are just too difficult to dodge, usually because of the rooms that they spawn in, have too many enemies or rocks. 
I think that they should either be slightly nerfed, or rooms that contain them should be slightly modified to make dodging easier. Quad Revenant is a great example of a very difficult enemy that isn't overwhelming because the rooms containing them enable the player to dodge its attacks. Trites should really have a cap on the distance that they can jump. It just feels unfair when one jumps across the map to snipe you, especially given their somewhat unpredictable jumps. Needles and pasties are just super annoying. They can essentially telefrag you and cause damage that was nearly unavoidable. This is especially true when you don't know that the enemies are in the room, which is true at the beginning of every room that they spawn in. Simply giving them an audio cue, like wall masters have, would make them a lot more bearable. The puzzle rooms with the spike blocks and such get old after a while, specifically in the mausoleum where they are much more common. I felt much more strongly about this when the game first came out, because I was going to the alt path on almost every run. But even now, when I go to the mausoleum much less frequently, puzzle rooms feel extremely un-Isaac-like, because they are not dynamic. You solve them the same exact way almost every time you encounter them. This actively defies what makes Isaac so good in the first place, and the rooms only get more annoying the more you play the game and see them. On the flip side, the flying leech enemies found in the late game no longer take knockback, meaning you won't shoot them into you when you shoot at them while sidestepping. Thank you, Edmund. And thank you for removing closet boss rooms. Like, geez, those were just not plausible to be beaten hitless for many of the bosses. There were two major problems in the game at the time of writing this script that were promised to be fixed in future updates. The first was Tainted Jacob, who went from being flat out unfun and unfair to being perfectly playable, but still my least favorite character. I'll take what I can get with him, since I don't even like the concept behind his gimmick. The second thing that will, maybe, be changed in the future is the Delirium boss, who has a history of unfair, undodgeable attacks. The player can be telefragged by Delirium, the boss may move so fast that it's impossible to get out of the way, and simply fighting bosses you've already seen in the run without any new attacks from the boss other than omnidirectional bullets is just not as interesting as one of the secret ultimate bosses of the game should be. I haven't heard any word about what the rework will be, and from things that Edmund has said recently, it may never happen, as he would rather spend the remaining development time Isaac is getting adding new content to the game. As cool as new items or other content would be to get, I would rather the void be made a cool floor. One thing I hope comes with the update improving Delirium is new sprites for all the enemies on the void floor. There was a mod for Afterbirth Plus that is sadly not compatible with Repentance, called Delirious Void Remastered, which made all the enemies in the Void Floor look as though Delirium were transformed into them. This detail goes a long way in making the floor feel unique and like it has new content to show the player. But either way, I'm sure the remaining dev time Isaac gets will be spent adding cool new content to the game. There have been other significant problems in the game, but there are bugs that have been patched out of the game since I wrote this script. Birthright, an item that has a different effect for each of the 34 characters, was unfinished and only had effects for about half the characters. There were also softlocks with inverted tarot cards that teleport you. Leaving the Shadow Mom chase sequence in Mines too can mess with your pickups, and I've seen it level down Bumbo from his max level, as if he had never picked up any coins. These were eventually fixed, but I think that the game should have just been delayed a bit longer to iron these things out. I think Birthright being obviously unfinished clearly showed that. Finally, here's the last few remaining nitpicks and praises that I have for the game. The Void Portal hurts my eyes to look at. I like how you can just cheese boss rush by taking an item and then teleporting out. I also like how the guaranteed fool card on Depths 2 can facilitate this. It rewards players for going faster, when that usually isn't optimal. This is especially true in Repentance when the runs tend to be slower. The removal of spikes from the entryway of doors was an amazing change, but why don't all spikes just retract after clearing the room? Rooms with resources behind spikes can stay the way they are, but backtracking would be even easier if the player didn't need to worry about stepping on spikes from a room they've already cleared, and be less frustrating. Easter egg seeds are a nice little secret bonus that serve as a bit of bonus content, but I think that the game should make them a little more obvious so more players could know about them. I love the change for automatic recharging active items to fully recharge once clearing a room. Repentance added some very neat little interactions that are so niche I'd have never expected them to be programmed in the game, and I really appreciate them. 
Abel having a unique effect as Cain, Jacob's Ladder in 120 Volt having better conductivity in flooded rooms, and Isaac not having a reflection when he has Charm of the Vampire. These are all so niche and small that most players probably wouldn't even notice them if they do happen to have both things at once, but they make the game feel so much more detailed and like almost every possible combination of interactions had been considered in the game's development. This might just be me, but I feel like the game's music is too chilled and atmospheric. It makes me sleepy. Specifically, the depths music makes me tired and less motivated to finish the run. I almost always end up listening to either a modded soundtrack or music from YouTube while playing, though. Thank you for making that one specific room with the roundworms in it have a hole in the line of the pit so you can traverse it faster after clearing the room. This is so specific, but I appreciate it so much. Eternal Mode was a really cool free addition to the Flash Binding of Isaac that I wish got added to Repentance. It exists now as a mod for Repentance, and is pretty polished, but I still wish it got an official implementation. And because I don't know where else to put it, I'll describe my thoughts on pills here. There are 50 pills in the game, 13 of which are available on any given run. Each run, each of the 13 pill colors is given a random effect from the pool of 50. Player stances on pills can wildly differ, which I think is really cool. I personally think that pills are good overall, as the good pills influence your stats more than the bad ones, and the negative effects of some of the bad pills can be reduced by only using them under specific circumstances. I know other players that are better than me that swear off pills almost entirely, but I also know other high level players that also think that they're situational, but more good than bad. To use pills well, you have to be able to foresee how they could cause adverse effects before you use them making sure not to use them when a bad trip could put you down to 1 HP or when a paralysis could leave you open to attacks are example of this. Kilburn, a programmer of Afterworth Plus and the programmer of Repentance, was kind enough to let me interview him for this video. I asked him questions about mostly the game balance and mechanics, but some other questions as well. I realize that this section is very long and not everyone is going to be as interested in listening to it. So if you'd like to skip to the conclusion and my final thoughts on Isaac, you can skip to the timestamp in the description. A few of the questions are also out of order because I wanted to keep the same topic questions together. But without further ado, here's the interview. First, I want to ask you some questions about um, like possible tweaks or changes to game mechanics. Um, so uh. my first question is about Eden tokens. So like, oh, yeah. yeah, like they used to serve a purpose to prevent players from basically just holding R until they got an item that they wanted to play with. But that doesn't really, that purpose isn't really served anymore now that people can just cheat if they want to with like the debug, like that's really easy. And I feel like it even takes away from the game because um, speed running the game, which I've tried before, um, there's the most popular category, I think, is seven character speed run, which is you... Right do seven runs with seven different characters. Eden is always the character people do first because they just hold R until they get a really strong item. And that makes it difficult for legitimate players to, um, like, you know, legitimate players can't really do that. They can't just hold R until they get a good item for a speed run because that's, they would go through them super fast. Um, is it possible that Eden tokens could ever be taken out of the game? Uh see why they should be taken out. I mean, this is if this is just a speedrunning thing, this doesn't really affect uh, regular players. Like, I don't, I don't think you should be encouraged to just hold R until you get a good run. Like, for speedrunning, I can understand this, because like, you're trying to do this as quickly as possible. But when actually I'm playing the game, I honestly don't see... Like, I, I honestly don't want to encourage that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's like, I think you should. I, I think you're supposed to play with whatever the game gives you. Like yeah, I I agree with that. When whenever I'm playing, what, I, I I like the more difficult runs. But um, that's that's what interesting. What I would consider what I would consider is maybe making Eden tokens in it if you've beaten everything as Eden. Yeah, like I, I think that that makes good sense. That that's the one thing I would probably consider. But like I I wouldn't remove them from the game. Like straight, like right from the beginning. Do you think that um? Do you think that they really discourage cheating, like the existence of Eden tokens? Because I feel like anyone who wanted to. Well, just... if you want to cheat, if you want to cheat, you should like 
just go ahead. But you would need at least the you you would need to enable at least the console and then you know start doing stuff with it. Okay. That's so interesting. Uh, like yeah. So the moment you you decide that you're going to do this, there isn't really much we can do about that. But yeah. if you're trying to play the game legitimately, then I don't think restarting the game until you get a good run should be something that we encourage the player to do. Okay. Okay. I see. Interesting. Thank you. My next question is, um, what do you think about, like, um, I, th I think that an issue that if you play this game a lot, you'll run into sometimes, um, which can be especially annoying on streaks, is if... Um, say you're on like the depths two and you take an unknown pill and then it's telepills and it teleports you into the error room before you get the polaroid or the negative and then you're not able to you know get the get the polaroid or negative to go to the final floor um right. is there any is... way that would you ever implement something to prevent something like that from happening if if we can figure out a good solution for this yeah absolutely uh, i don't think i don't think that should happen is there um do you think that there really needs to be like something gating you from getting to the last floor? Because I think that, I mean, I guess there's an argument now that there could be after repentance changed um, the negative, but um, I feel like you should just be able to go to the final floor regardless of whichever one you picked up, which would prevent that problem from ever happening. I guess there are some arguments for that. Uh, I would have to think about it. But again, like that's how the game has been this, this whole years. So I'm not sure how much I would consider changing that. Okay. It's something to think about, but yeah, can't really tell right now. Okay. Um, what do you think about um the curses in the game? Cause, okay, what do you think about um curse of unknown and darkness? Because I feel like those ones don't really affect gameplay very much. Um, what are your thoughts on those? Oh, they're okay. Like, Curse of the Unknown, like, yeah, you just have to manually keep track of your health, but you could mess up. I actually quite like that curse, because, like, if you're not trying too hard to get around it, it can be pretty stressful, because you don't know for sure how much health you have. And, and I think there is some fun in trying to figure out exactly how much how much you have. It makes you think a little before you start using blood donation machines and whatnot. Um, I think Curse of Darkness is completely okay as well. Uh, we made it way too dark on release. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. It, it, but it's way better now. And I honestly just like how it looks. I, I know, not a, I, I know not, a, not a lot of people like, you know, not being able to see enemies, but I think we've adjusted most of the room design so that that's not really a problem. That's that's interesting that you say that, because I, I feel like Curse of Darkness doesn't, like, I feel like it doesn't affect gameplay almost at all, and when it does, it's frustrating. Like, um, if there's, like, a spider that you don't see because spiders are so dark, um, I feel like that spider, causes frustration. Spider kind of flash red, though, so you can, you can see them. Yeah, like, I wouldn't mind making them more visible, but again, like, I don't see Curse of Darkness as a real problem. Okay, yeah, that's just interesting. I wanted to know your opinion. And Curse of the Unknown, I feel like, I, I kind of feel like it discourages players from interacting with things like blood donation machines because they they don't know exactly how much health they have, so they might just decide not to risk it. Well, that's their choice. They mm -hmm. could just... You know, they could just take the risk and try it anyway. Okay. There are ways to know how much health you have, even if you can't see it. Yeah, you can see some, like if uh, if the challenge room is open, or um, if Isaac yeah, pees, for, like, yeah. Yeah, for example. I think that's fine. Okay. Um, what do you think about Curse of the Blind? Because I feel like... Curse of the Blind is a great curse. I know many people hate it. I think it's completely fine. I, I don't have any intention of changing it. Do you think that... Because the way that I see Curse of the Blind, I think that it's really good for beginner and intermediate level players because they might see something like um, 
like tiny planet and be like, oh, I don't want to take that. But if it's Curse of the Blind, they might pick it up um, not knowing. Yeah. And that could force them to see like, oh, if you have tiny planet and um, lump of coal, like that can be really good. And then they might change their perspective on an item they used to think was bad and just not interact with. Like, I really like that. But I feel like um, for players who are really experienced with the game and think that they already know everything, it um, if you're playing streaks at least, or a run that you really don't want to lose, it just, I feel like it doesn't make an interesting decision. It um, If you're doing streaks, usually what most players do, I think, is just they don't take any blind items, which, you know, decreases the amount that they're interacting with the game. Well... Okay, but how many players in the play, like how how much how much of the player base does streaks? Yeah, I mean like that's a good point. Like, o- how only much, people who are really like, far yeah. into the game. Not very many people. Yeah, there you go. Okay. I just wanted to hear so what I you had to think about that. Like at this point if you're doing streaks, you might as well just mod the game so that it's you know, it doesn't introduce this sort of issues. Like, if that's truly a problem. Mm-hmm. And I, I really appreciate the how, as kind of a consolation of that, at least, if you're doing streaks, um, if you skip, like, blind item rooms, you get more planetariums. I think that that's really nice. Yeah. So I think it works out. Okay. Um, and what do you think about Curse of the Maze and Lost? Because I feel like those ones um, are just kind of annoying. Yeah, I don't really like these two as much. Um not really sure what I would do about them. Like, we, we've already sort of made Curse of the Maze less annoying because it doesn't send you, well, it usually doesn't send you into rooms you, you've already visited. So you don't have these annoying loops of just walking back and forth and just like ending up in the same room over and over again. So it's not as annoying as it used to be. Yeah. Um, Curse of the Lost is... Yeah, I honestly don't know about that one. I, I'm not very fond of it, but... Do you think that that I, curse I, could ever be point, removed? I don't know if we really have a good reason to do that. If we have like a really good reason to do it, then yeah, sure. Like if one day we ever decide to like actually go and change how certain curses work. But other than that, I can't really imagine it happening. Okay. Does um do you know what Edmund thinks about that curse? Because I feel like that specifically Curse of the Lost is really just kind of like it just annoys everyone. I don't really see much that it adds to the game. Uh, I'm kind of neutral about it, honestly. Hmm. Okay. Like yeah, it is annoying, but it's like it's really not the worst thing ever. There's there's mods called Trinket Stacking Plus and Tarot Cloth Plus, which give um, Trinket Stacking Plus gives like more uh, trinkets golden trinket effects, like uh, like Isaac's head. It'll give you two Isaac's head if you pick up gold Isaac's head, and Tarot Cloth Plus. If you have Tarot Cloth, it gives um, more effects to more cards. Like if you use the World with Tarot Cloth and the mod, it reveals the Ultra Secret Room. Yeah, I, I see where this is going. Uh, I haven't actually looked at these mods. But this is something we're planning on doing as well. Like, okay. uh, I've seen a lot of people wonder if like trinkets are going to get more golden trinket effects. And that's that's true. That's a problem. We just haven't had time to do all of them before release. Uh, I have some questions about broken hearts. So like um, broken hearts, they're in the game and they're, there's only three items, I think, that give you broken hearts. Um. And there's also the confessionals, which can remove them. I think broken hearts seem like a really cool mechanic, but it seems like they're kind of underutilized with only three items um, giving you any broken hearts. Uh, was there any like plan to implement more things that used broken hearts or have them as a bigger mechanic in the game? Yeah, we have some ideas. I can't tell you about them. Oh, okay. Okay, how about um, greed mode? So... A lot of players kind of don't like greed mode, uh, myself included, um, and I th- I think that a lot of players are frustrated that there's specifically like 
a couple of really big unlocks behind greed mode. Um, especially like the lost having holy mantle is really far into greed mode. Um, and one that I specifically kind of don't understand is um, you have to unlock greedier mode before you can play it. Could that ever, uh, could those that, rewards that ever be tweaked? I don't know, but that is something that's been kind of bothering me as well. But I don't know if we're going to do anything about that yet. Okay. I know that. Um, I, mean, I know that there's. Know a... it has its fair share of issues, but again, this is something that's going to take a while, so I can't really promise anything at the moment. Yeah, I know that there's only so many things you can do while you're still working on the game. And um, uh, I was just curious, what do you think of Eternal Mode from the Flash, Isaac? And was there ever a plan on including it in Repentance? Uh, not including it, but we did borrow a few ideas from it. Like, the, the Tainted Enemies were basically designed as if they were Eternal Champions. Oh, that's cool. Like, yeah. we, we wanted to... We wanted, we wanted to take the feel of Eternal Mode and kind of kind of replicate that with some of the tainted enemies in a way. That's a really cool... Uh, yeah, that's cool. I like that. These next questions are a little bit different. They're about like your perspective on like the game more in general. Um, okay. So do you play... Do you play Isaac like just for fun still? Uh it's not as much I used to. Uh, I still do rather so once in a while, just for fun, and just to get ideas as well. You can't really get ideas for the game unless you play it, so that's very important. Uh huh. Okay. Um, and do you ever play with mods? Um, sometimes, but I usually prefer just playing the game vanilla. Uh, how come you usually? prefer vanilla that's just how it is uh i just i, I just prefer it that's okay all. um and do you think that do you think that you'll play the game more after you're done working on it i might i was considering doing a full run all the way to dead god from a, a clean save i think that would be very interesting I've never actually experienced the whole thing. Uh, normally that's something I would do, but since we had to finish, you know, since, since we had to finish the game and release it, I just didn't have, I just didn't have time to do that. Uh huh. Okay. Um, what, what do you think about, um, greed mode just in general? I like it. I think it gets old after a while. It, it gets very samey because you're always going through the same floors. And I think green mode also gives you too many choices. So your runs also tend to be the same because you're always optimizing them in the same way. Like you're always going for damage. Uh, but you just want as much DPS as possible and then you're picking you're picking up all the good tier effects and whatnot. That's a... Uh, uh, in a normal run, you don't really have this problem as much as, unless you're playing as Isaac, because you have the D6. But in greed mode, any character can just reroll anything in the shop. So naturally, you're just going to reroll until you get uh, something that increases your damage in some way. So no. I think that also contributes to the mode being very samey after a while. That's interesting because I, I agree that the mode is um, really samey, but I actually kind of have a different um, opinion on it. I feel like you go for defensive items a lot more because I feel like once you reach the point that you're able to kill the waves um, of regular enemies as fast as they spawn, you want to just go for as much health as possible because of Ultra Greed's super armor. Um, I think that's interesting that you say that you go for as much damage as possible. That's interesting. Well, I guess people will just play differently. I usually just personally just go for damage whenever I can. And the uh, thing about boss armor is that you can still overpower it if your damage is high enough. You like yeah, but I feel like the only opportunity that you ever get to actually do that in greed mode, since um, 
the number of items you get is relatively limited to a regular run is if you break the game, at which point you would have, you know, like, maximum health and also a ton of damage. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, and do you think that, like, what do you think about breaking the game in general, like, and also in greed mode? Because in greed mode, it's a lot easier if you just get, like, the d20 or something like that. Yeah, I still don't know how to feel about the d20. It's probably okay. But I, I, I would prefer it if you had to really go out of your way to break the game. Uh, I think we've mostly addressed this in Repentance, but before that, I felt like the game was just too easy to break. And that just doesn't make it as satisfying when it does happen. Oh, I 100% agree with that, yeah. If, it, if it, you can make it happen every run, it's like, it doesn't feel worth your time to do it since usually it takes a while. Yeah. It's just not as special. I, I remember breaking the game back in Rafa Milan with D20 and I think Bumpfront. I think, I think if you have Bumpfront uh, and a Blood Donation Machine in D20, you can get a ton of the cups to spawn really, like, really quickly. And that was pretty fun. I think that was the first time I'd ever like, really broken the game. Like, yeah, I, I like game-breaking stuff being kept at arms, more than arm's length away, because I feel like if, if there's ever, like, because people, some, sometimes my friends tell me, like, oh, if something's, like, too strong, just don't pick it up. And I'm like, it's not the no, same. <laughs> that's not the same. If you have to go out of your way. So, okay, so basically the game shouldn't just offer you to break it. Uh, that's where I would draw the line. You, if you want to break the game, you have to go out of your way to do it. You, you shouldn't just avoid something the game offers you. Yeah, because I think it's... I, I don't think that's fun. It just feels way more satisfying to be trying your hardest to win yeah, and not absolutely. knowing if you will make it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay, what do you think about pills? Do you take pills when you play the game? Oh, always. Yeah, but like that's what I thought. You you make the mechanics. I would think you would want to interact with them. Yeah, but like even before working on the game, I would always take pills. I just don't see a reason not to take them. What do you think about um a lot of? I mean, I say a lot. It's basically just the ones that I'm aware of. Um, the high level Isaac players that I'm aware of usually don't take pills. Um, just and in that's general, fine because. That's fine, because if you're trying to win, I can understand not wanting to take a risk. But I usually don't try that hard to win a run. I mostly just, you know, I mostly just play the game and see where that leads me. Do you think that pills um, actually do decrease your odds of winning, though? Not really, but it's still a risk. I can understand people not wanting to take that risk. Okay, yeah, I, I pretty much agree with that. I think that I personally think that pills are overall a, a positive. It's just you need to know some situations where you don't take them if you want to yeah, yeah make sure that you don't um, lose a streak or something. Yeah. The, the thing is, if you get like a tears down or a health down, yeah, that sucks. But at least now you know it's a bad pill. You're not going to take it again. Yeah, exactly. And then if so you find a good one, they... you can take it again still if you see it again. Yeah. Yeah. So the positives usually offset the negatives. Um, okay, when you were working, I mean, you're still working on Repentance. While working on Repentance, um, have there been any um, any features or something that you wanted to include, but maybe you weren't allowed to implement, like Edmund said, that he didn't agree with it, or there just wasn't time to include? Um, not that I can think of. Like, usually, if there is a feature that doesn't really work out, I just realized that it's not like very good. Is there? A, can you give an example of something that you decided against including? Uh, I, don't know if I, I think at some point we considered making tainted Jacob actually just Jacob and Isao but stitched together. Like they're both cut in half and then stitched together, and then you would be able to whole control to split them and then control them separately. 
And that sounded really interesting on paper. And then I tried implementing it and it was borderline unplayable. Like it was terrible. So we just completely scrapped it. What was the problem with it? Because that sounds really similar to just how they are already in the game, uh, Jacob and Esau. Well, when I say control separately, it was basically WASD uh, for Jacob and the arrow keys for Esau, and they would just auto fire at the nearest enemies. Oh, they would auto fire? And, okay. Yeah. And that was an absolute headache to control. It, it just wasn't fun at all. And I'm saying this as someone who really loves playing as Jacob and Esau. <laughs> all right, interesting. Um, all right. If, um, cause I remember back, um, a little bit before Repentance was released, Edmund in an interview said that, uh, you were like designing bosses and you wanted them to have like really crazy difficult attack patterns. And then he was like, no, 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 this is too hard for the average player. You need to make it easier. Um, is there any other stuff like that, that, um, that you maybe had to tone down or like the, the balance had to what? be shifted from where you would have liked it to be? It was mostly just Dogma and Beast. Oh, those were the specific uh, bosses he was talking about? Yeah, for the most part, uh, I agreed with most of the changes we had to make. Uh, a lot of bosses in anti birth were, were just overcomplicated. Like, they had way too much going on. And that was... I made them at a time when I would think that more complex things are usually better, which is not the case. Like so usually you usually you want to go for simplicity. That's the best way to make an interesting boss. You just keep it simple, easy to understand, but you still try to give it interesting attacks that make you deal with the fight in a unique way. I think that's the best way to design a boss. Mm hmm I I haven't personally played anti birth, but um it it sounds like that would be um maybe having more attacks would make the experience better for players who play for a long time, but maybe worse for no. players. No, no, it, it would be annoying. It would just be annoying and confusing. Uh, if you want an example of like very anti birth design, uh, the visage is a pretty good example. It's pretty much the same as the way it was in anti birth. And I don't like it. <laughs> it's not a fun fight. It's way too confusing. There's way too much going on. And uh, I wanted to redesign it a little bit for a while now. All right, interesting. I can see that. Um, all right, well, that was like the enemies. Um, are there any items that you kind of don't like the balance of right now? Um, nothing, I can, nothing I can really think of. I mean, there is C-section. C-section is way too strong. And that was an accident on my part. I didn't have time to test it as much as I would have liked before releasing, releasing the update. And the damage value on the fetus is, are, is just way too high. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like it, it it's really good. Be, it shouldn't be able to carry a run on its own. And that was a big problem we had with TechX. Like TechX could carry a run with just no other item. You could easily beat the game with nothing but TechX, uh, which is why we uh, we rebalanced it a little bit. What do you think? Uh, um... Oh, do you have more? Yeah, which is which is why like, I don't like uh, C-section in this current state. I know people love it. It is a very strong item, but I just feel like the damage is way too high. Yeah, um, yeah. If you ask me, I I agree that the damage is too high. It is kind of like a single item uh, win. Yeah, and I, I don't think I don't think single item wins should really be a thing, unless they're extremely hard to get. What do you um What do you think about like that kind of perspective from a large part of the player base that um, nerfs are just kind of bad overall, and that more well, like more strong items makes the game better no that's i can't say i agree with that like the problem is if you have if you keep adding more strong items to the game there's going to be less and less incentive 
to pick up the other items. Right? Yeah, yeah, I completely agree and, with that. And like part of the appeal, part of the game's appeal is that there are so many items and they interact with each other in so many different ways. So in some cases, I think it's completely okay to nerf an item to let other items shine. Yeah, I, I think that uh, that was a problem in um, Afterbirth Plus. Um, I think that it was, like Cricket's Head, for example, you would see so often because it was in the gold chest pool that it kind of completely pushed the lower value items out of like any sort of relevancy. Yeah, you just didn't care about any other item in that pool. You just opened the golden chest for Cricket's Head, basically. Okay, and then... um. While we're talking about item nerfs, I'm there's some because like there were a lot of nerfs um, to items that were exceedingly powerful. Like um, magic mush, for example, was made to appear in less pools, which I think makes sense. But um, it wasn't really a nerf. It's just it didn't make sense to me that something like that would be in the boss pool. Okay. Um, some specifically roid rage and tapeworm though. Roid Rage was nerfed to give um, less speed and I think less range, and Tapeworm... I don't, I don't really view Roid Rage as a nerf, because too much speed can be a bad thing as well. It just bothered me that an item could just single-handedly max out your speed. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, like, I can see that. Like, it, it just completely devalues every other speed upgrade in the boss pool. Yeah. I thought... So, it, it just... It's more of an adjustment, in my opinion. Like... Too much speed can't be a good thing either. Uh, it feels more balanced to me this way. I used to think it was um, interesting though because I thought that um, having uh, having some items be like how do I how do I phrase this like um because like Cricket's head is like a damage up but it's a super good damage up and there wasn't really an equivalent to that to speed other than Roid Rage. So I thought it was interesting to have um, one, one speed upgrade that was especially strong um, in Afterbirth Plus. I suppose. Although you could say that Mercurius is technically that super speed upgrade. But yeah, still, I, I see what you mean. And, um, and then also Tapeworm was nerfed. It used to double your range and now it gives you a flat upgrade. I was just like, I, I'm kind of confused uh... by that. That's not actually, that might not have been an intentional nerf because we completely changed the, the way range works and that might have been a side effect of that. Huh, okay. Yeah, because I, I was confused because range is kind of like really a low value stat once you have enough um, that doubling it usually doesn't add that much value, but it could make certain synergies a lot better like um, like a lump of coal and rubber cement or something like that. Yeah. What do you think is the best way to play the game in terms of looking up um, the effects of items? Hmm. Um, I think it's okay to have platinum go to to have uh, platinum god open while you play the game because some items are just way too obscure to figure out, and like I can see, I can see why you would want to know what an item does before you pick it up. Although, if I played the game, I, I, like, if, I, if I played the game myself without like, ever playing it before, I would probably try to play it blind first until I get every item in the game. And then I would start looking them up to really know the details. Mm -hmm. that, that's interesting, yeah. Going all the way until you unlock everything. That seems like a... Yeah, that seems that like it'd make the game a lot harder, to be honest. That's how I would personally do it. That's cool. Um, and do you think that... What are your thoughts on people who want um, like external item description or something like it to be implemented in the official game? It, sh it should not be in the, the official game. Uh, do you think it, that makes it too easy it, to look up? It's not that it makes it too easy, it doesn't fit. It's not appropriate. Mm -hmm. It... It's a great mod, I'm glad that it exists, but it's not something that should be in the game by default. It's not an option that you should give to every player unless they actually go out of their way to look for it. 
Do you think that it doesn't fit because of the aesthetics and sensibilities of Isaac, the way that there's like so few menus in the game? That's one of the reasons, yeah. Uh, Isaac is something that conveys a lot of ideas in very few words. Yeah, I I agree with that. I liked that a lot about the game. Um, and while, while we're talking about like the menus and stuff, um, what how like was it difficult to decide to break that precedent for things like Tainted Isaac, where he has his own HUD, or uh, or Tainted Kane and characters like that? Um, well, it just seemed necessary. Like we wanted to experience. So, so the Tainted characters were just a way to mess around with really weird, really out there game mechanics, see what works and what doesn't. And for some of them, it just wasn't possible without adding some sort of extra hard. Yeah, I think that... Um... This is something I wanted to avoid, but like in some cases, you just have to do it. Yeah, I, I agree with that. There's not really any way that those characters could work without being able to see those extra menus, but they they did break the precedent, but I think that it's to their benefit that they broke a precedent because there was so much... Like, that had never been done before. I feel like there was so much room to explore with that idea then. Yeah, that's what we wanted to do with the tainted characters. Like, really go and do something weird that we haven't really done before. What do you think about Hush as, um, as like, a bonus boss? Because going uh, to Hush... As a, Hush? As, a boss, as a boss, I really like Hush. Uh, I know there is this problem with, uh, like, his continuum attack where it can overlap with other attacks and that's something I've been looking into. But other than that, I really like the fight. Uh, I also like how you get there. I like that you have to play the game quickly and you can't just min-max every floor. Um, I do wish there was something after Rush, like an incentive to go there other than just guaranteed void yeah that's what i was gonna say because you're fighting what is one of the hardest bosses in the game like harder than blue baby and then you don't really get anything for having done that unless you're going to fight delirium yeah pretty much and uh i'm not sure what we're going to do about that if we're even going to do anything there's um i know that i'm aware of a mod that i think a lot of people like that drop hush drops eden's blessing when you kill him what do you think about that uh, <laughs> honestly, uh, no, I, I I would not do that. Do you think that, uh, like, why not? Do you think that would make future, it'd be too big of an incentive or it'd make future runs too easy? Well, you would just do every run, you, you would just try to do harsh every run, and then the next run would be slightly easier. I, I just don't see what that brings to the game. Uh huh. Okay. I mean, like, I can I can see it where because then that is a legitimately appealing uh reason to go to fight Hush and rush for it on most runs when you can. But um, yeah. If there if there was some other objective or um incentive to go see fight him, I can see that being better. Yeah. Um. I mean, I would like to find a solution. I just don't know if that's gonna happen. Okay, what what can you tell me about um, rare champion enemies? Like, I I know that there's I've noticed that there's some champions that appear much less frequently than others. Like the there's one that spawns poop and the giant champion and the healer champion. Yeah. Like um, I don't know. Like, just what can you tell me about them? Uh, how did you decide to make some of them more rare? Uh, I mean, I didn't. That that was an afterbirth plus thing. Oh, all of those. The poop one is yeah. new, right? Well, the poop one is new, but the others are from Afterbirth Plus. And I see why it was done. It makes them more special. It, yeah, it's it, nice it's... to have. Yeah, it's nice to have something that you don't see as often as the rest. Yeah, I remember seeing the poop one like hundreds of hours into Repentance and being like, "Wait, what? Since when is that in the game?" And that was just like really yeah. exciting to know that there's there there could be more new things I haven't seen in the game even hundreds of hours later. Yeah, there you go. That's the reason. All right, I, and then I was just kind of curious, like, why is the, 
the ghost one that can like walk over rocks and gaps a rare one because or is it a rare one i think it is it's not as rare as the others it's like somewhere in between oh they have they they have individual rarities yeah they do oh okay i didn't know that which one is the most rare Uh, you can't really ask me for all the specifics (laughs) all right um Okay, what do you think about daily runs? Do you are do daily runs appeal to you at all? No, not at all. I when I play roguelikes, I just don't bother with the daily runs. I don't see, I don't personally see the appeal in just min maxing, like trying to get the highest possible score, which is how most people play daily runs. Mm-hmm. Because like there's always going to be there's always going to be a way to get the optimal score, but usually it's not a very fun way. It's a very tedious way. And I don't want to get I, I don't want to go there. Mm-hmm. Like my yeah. my favorite kind of daily run is like dailies where you, you just have to go as far as possible. Like it's all about just play the game and play it well. Yeah, and like nuclear throne. That matters. Exactly. I think Nuclear Throne, like Nuclear Throne, is the only game in which I've actively played daily runs for a long time. But for something like Isaac, I just can't imagine it. Do you think that, um, because like yeah, I can uh, I can see what you're saying with um, the the optimal solution usually isn't very exciting, but even beyond that, do you think that dailies in roguelites are like flawed? A flawed idea entirely because of the random nature. I don't. I don't know if I would call them objectively flawed. I, I don't like them, but that's just like that's just a personal thing. I'm sure there are a lot of people out there who love this sort of thing. It's just not for me. Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, do you think that what's the reason why there's never been? Um, an Isaac Daly, where you go to Beast or Mother, or where you can play as a tainted character? Uh, well, tainted characters are way too different for dailies, in my opinion. Like, I've talked about this in the AMA, but like, just imagine how a tainted cane daily would go. I mean, yeah, that, that imagine, one is obviously... Imagine, <laughs> yeah, would be crazy. Imagine if that happened. Imagine if that happened multiple times a year. Uh, I don't think people would have a good time. Uh, do you not and, think that that's already kind of a problem, though? Because um, the melee characters like Forgotten and also Jacob and Esau, I feel like, are really different from all the other characters and kind of make... They can make dailies more frustrating because you take more damage. I was on the fence about those two, but I, I think it's mostly okay. Like, I still don't know whether that was a good decision or not. But, like, this is something, like, I mean, we've already done it, right? Mm-hmm. And we might as well do it for consistency so that all uh, all characters, all normal characters are pretty important dailies. But for tainted characters, I would probably think a bit more carefully before putting them in. Because, again, some of them can be so different. Uh-huh. Um, I, I would like to see... Uh... Tainted characters and dailies, uh, most of them, anyways. I I would agree that Tainted Cain would be, um, just not a fun daily to play. But um, like Tainted Apollyon is not very different from most of the regular characters, and I don't really see a reason yeah. why he shouldn't be in there. Yeah, I guess so. This is something we've been thinking about, but we don't really know. Um, we don't really know what we're going to do yet. Mm-hmm. But it, it's something we've been thinking about. And then the the alternate paths on dailies. Uh, well, back then that was just so that there wouldn't be any spoilers. But now this is probably something we could. Do. Okay, yeah, I was I was surprised that after a year there still hadn't been any. Oh, if the rooms in the alt path are made so difficult that you're expected to take damage when you go to them. I think you can do them without taking damage. It's just harder, but it's possible. Was that um? Was that so? Like, yeah, okay. So the rooms in the alt path are more difficult. Was that an intentional decision to 
offset the benefits that you get from going to them to get the extra item from like Gehenna 2. Uh, I just... Wait, what do you mean? Because if you oh, go you to Gehenna like 2, you get an extra item yes. in the shop. Well, that's just an extra thing, but I just wanted the out path to be harder than the normal one, because this is what you would expect. Mm -hmm. It just makes sense to me. That's interesting. You've already had you, you already had you've already had experience with the normal path, so it makes sense that the alt path would be harder. Yeah, that's interesting because the the way that I had interpreted the increased difficulty of the alt path was to add some resistance for the benefits that you get from going there. Where, uh, like down for you. We actually did that. We actually did that the other way around. We made the path harder, and then we added incentives. Oh, okay. That's cool. And then um, something that I feel like has should have been different in the game for like since Rebirth is the way that trites jump. I feel like they can jump too far. It's kind of it like it can be rare, but um, sometimes they I mean, can just yeah they can snipe you across the screen, but you know just keep moving. Okay, okay. I just wanted to know what you thought about those. I have absolutely no. I have absolutely no problem with trites. I think they're completely fine. And um. And it, it makes it makes for funny gifts when someone gets sniped. <laughs> like yeah, it's really funny. Um, and what do you think about um, Carry On Queen and Mask of Infamy? Like, I I feel like they can be really frustrating if you don't have tools to deal with them. Uh, Carrion Queen is mostly okay. Mask of Infamy can be a real pain if your shot speed is very low. Do you think that those could ever be tweaked to make it easier to fight them if you don't have creep or bombs or something like that? Who knows? Maybe. <laughs> okay. Um, and then I just wanted to know your opinion on TM Trainer. Like, when you're playing, do you take that item? Yeah. Always. Interesting. I I think that that item is like, at least from the perspective of playing on streaks, that's the only item that I think I well, would like yeah. never take. Yeah, if you're playing on a streak, yeah, don't take it. That makes sense. But otherwise, it's fine. Just, you know, you don't have to win every run. <laughs> you just take it and see what happens. Yeah, if you just want to see, like, if you want to have a funny run. Yeah. I, I really like the perspective that you have on the game and Edmund too because mm -hmm. when I see players saying like um like oh I, I wish that they didn't nerf uh 2020 like why did they make the game less yeah. fun like I, I totally disagree with that because I think that if the I feel like that makes the game too easy to set the precedent that things will only get stronger and never weaker and that just yeah. makes the game so much less engaging when you win without having to try at all yeah pretty much like, people always make the argument that a game doesn't need to be balanced if it's a single-player game, and that is not true at all. Like, just because just because a game is single-player doesn't mean that it doesn't need to be balanced. Yeah, of course. Like, the, the reason people balance games is... Like, the reason a game gets balanced is to make it more enjoyable. In, in a competitive game, it's not fun if like a character can steamroll every other character in the game, right? Yeah. It, it, it's because so so the developers nerf that character to make the game more enjoyable overall. So why would that not apply to a single player game as well? If yeah. a mechanic is so powerful that it completely overshadows every other mechanic and just makes the game overall less fun, why shouldn't it be adjusted? Yeah, I, I really if like it, how it, Edmund has said it too. Like he, I think he said that like, you guys think that you know what you want, but you don't. And, and I'm doing like, I'm doing you guys a service of like, <laughs> fixing it even though you guys are like arguing with me. That's a great way to put it. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm really glad that there were a lot of item nerfs because in after like I still loved Afterbirth Plus, and to be honest, when I was playing Afterbirth Plus after the last patch that had so many quality of lifes, like um, you can pick up consumables faster, and like Kramps's head no longer rotates and stuff like that. I was like, this is it. This is like as good as Isaac can get. 
and then Repentance came out, and I was like, oh my god, I was so wrong. It's, like, so much better now. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad we didn't mess things up. Yeah, I think, I think it's unfortunate that a lot of players don't appreciate, um, the, the new balance, but, um, I think that I think they will come around, or if they don't, I mean that's just that's their loss, honestly. It was um like yeah, Repentance did have worse reviews when it came out, right? Than than now, yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I don't mind it. Like I understand you're used to the game being a certain way, so of course, if things change, you're not going to be happy about it. I, I hope that those players change their mind since then, but like. Again, like I, I have no regrets. I think the game is in a better place now. It, I'm much happier with it than I used to be. And this is basically the only reason I'm doing this in the first place. So that's the win in my book. That seems that seems like crazy to <laughs> you. Like you love the game so much that you got the opportunity to just like balance it. <laughs> yeah. That's it, cool. it is it is crazy to me, but yeah, I, I'm very happy with the game now. I hope that I didn't come off as like being um too critical. Like I I brought up a lot of stuff that I personally have problems with in the game and think oh, oh being critical is completely fine. Like the game is not perfect by any means. There are so many things that could still be improved, but at some point, I just need to consider the game done. Otherwise, I would be spending probably 10 more years on it my last question from this section is um how do you feel about like the reception of repentance because the steam reviews on rebirth and afterbirth are both like pretty high uh, 97 and 93 percent and then afterbirth plus is like kind of low it's 76 and then repentance yeah, is 78 it, yeah it's kind of in between that's more or less what i expected i knew it would, i knew it would piss a lot of people off with the balance changes but like personally, I think the game is in a better place now. Do you... I don't pay too much attention to reviews. Okay. So, um, did you make a lot of like uh, comp? Did you make any compromises with um, item balances that maybe you would have wanted to nerf them, but then you didn't because you thought that it would be perceived worse? No. No. Okay. I think one of the worst ones we did was maybe Restock and Boomstone, but I think they're both justified. 2020 and... is the one I've seen people complain about the oh, most. Oh yeah, 2020. 2020 is completely fine. 2020 is still an excellent item. There was just no reason for it to be this strong before. <laughs> yeah, it just doubled your damage and was just an item room item. Yeah. The game's still incredible, but I think it's like completely unrealistic to expect something this huge to be perfect because there's so many things that it does that it like is bound to get some things not perfectly right yeah i i appreciate it i was i actually thought about that as well like of course back then when i started working on this i wanted the game to be perfect as well and and then you kind of realize that it's just it's just way too big to make that happen like, you're never going to fix every single bug in the game because there are so many possible interactions. Yeah. So it's just a matter of fixing everything I can. And then if there is anything I've missed, it's probably okay. As long as it doesn't completely break the game. Okay. Um, I have some questions on characters now. So I know that your favorite character is Tainted Lost. Yeah. Um, don't you think that, like, I don't know, I'm interested in why he's your favorite character, because personally, I think that he's really samey, because you always just get, like, really strong items, and then become yeah. super powerful, like... Yeah, but it's risky, because you're not guaranteed to win, uh, to win a run. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't play him all the time, like, I, I like switching back and forth between characters, but he is one of my favorites. All right, that's interesting, because I just thought that he kind of goes against the philosophy of Isaac of, like, every run being completely different. 
where a lot of them converge to really similar uh, endpoints of just being super powerful. Yeah, super powerful in different ways, I suppose. Okay. Again, I wouldn't play him all the time, but he is still one of my favorite characters. Yeah, okay. You could argue that runs get, also, get very samey as Isaac as well, because you can just reroll until you get the same items that you got like in a previous run. Yeah, that is true. You're always going to converge towards um, stronger items. Okay, and then I wanted to know what you thought about um, Tainted Kane and Tainted Maggie specifically, because I feel like those two characters are really, really powerful. Um, Tainted Kane, obviously not as much as he used to be, but what do you think about the balancing of those characters that are super strong? I think they're fine. Uh, Tainted Kane is only... No, actually, Tainted Kane is always pretty strong. That's a, that's a good point. But... Well, Tainted Kane was kind of a complicated situation. I, I think the way he was initially was fine. The, the problem is that I... I didn't imagine that people would uh, figure out all the recipes so quickly, which, like, honestly, I should have seen that coming. But... Like, for me, looking up the recipes, you're not supposed to look up the recipes. You're supposed to just take pickups, favor uh, better ones, because that they usually mean you're going to get better items. And um, and that's it. Yeah, I you thought just, that playing optimally just... as him um, at launch was really boring, because you would just, like, you didn't need to be engaged with the game at all after the first floor, when you got, like, Rock Bottom, Red Stew, and Soy Milk. Yeah, but the thing is, you're not supposed to look up the recipe. You were never supposed to. That was just supposed to be a bonus uh, if you figured it out. Mm -hmm. And then people figured it out and then posted the recipes and everyone assumed that that's just how you're supposed to play the character. And then they said, it's not fun. Of course it's not fun. You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as for Maggie, uh, she's a bit of a weird one. I, she's not one of my favorites, but I figure that someone out there might like her. I... Maybe because I, I wanted to make a character with a very different playstyle where uh, items, like self damage items that would normally be bad as most other characters, uh, they're really good with her. And that's what I wanted to go for, like a character that makes you view certain items in a completely different light. Yeah, like, and I in think a that... way, in a way that works. Uh, the only real issue I'm seeing with her is the sharp plug uh, interaction. Yeah, that's what I was going to bring up. I think that the way that she has a completely different set of like optimal items is really cool, and I think that that concept works really well, but yeah, with like Sharp Plug and The Habit, I think also are just like way too powerful as her. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't mind nerfing his interactions a little bit. I'm just not sure how to do it yet, but this is something I've been thinking about. Okay. But aside from that, I think she's fine. Yeah, like again, I think her concept is like really fun. It's just um, personally, I think that I, I get kind of um, bored with a run once I get something like, um, yeah, like the habit plus a swallowed penny or yeah. something like that. Yeah, once once you feel like you can't really lose anymore, the, the run just starts being fun. Yeah. Okay, what do you think about Tainted Jacob? And then like... Um... Uh, oh, Tainted Jacob is great. I, I like him a lot. I enjoy playing as him a lot. What do you think about, like, the rooms, though? Because there's some rooms that, like, are obviously not made for him to go through. Like, you know, the Flybridge room? Yeah. Yeah, like, um, do you, like, what do you think about when he encounters that room? Um, let's see. Well, the thing is, usually when I get to the Flybridge room, I just lock him up right away. And then at that point, my damage is usually good enough to kill the flies before he breaks loose. So 
it works out for me. But that room is has always been a bit of a problem anyway. So I don't think the problem is with the character himself, just the room is just it doesn't play well with a lot of like with certain runs. Mm-hmm. Blood Puppy is a problem with that room as well. Um what do you think about Tainted Jacob when when you could still kill Shadow Esau also? Like are you I never wanted I never wanted that. Uh I thought that was a mistake. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad we removed it. Yeah, it was I, I don't think that it was necessarily a terrible idea, but I think that the amount of HP he had made it inadvisable. Because uh, you would always end up killing him if you got a strong run. Yeah, that's the problem. The last character question. Uh, could a couple character, like a couple of regular characters ever get pocket actives? Because I feel no. like... like <laughs> no. I, I know that you've been asked this, and it's like... I agree that on Isaac, pocket uh, pocket D6 would kind of just be bad. It would be way too good. But um, I think that specifically Eve and Lilith, are, their items aren't super good, but also they contribute to their character so much. And in the case of Eve, I think that she's kind of... She can be kind of underpowered on most runs if you no. don't end up getting... No. No? No, no, no. Absolutely not. Eve is, to me, one of my favorite characters, even in Rebirth. She's completely fine. She's a very strong character. I I just don't see why she would need a buff. Lilith, I can kind of see. Like her identity relies a lot of a lot on her box of friends. Uh but I don't know if making it a pocket active would be a solution. Okay. Okay. I was just interested on um specifically those two. Okay, and then um, I have just a few more questions about just like not really related to Isaac. Mm-hmm. So um, okay, what's what's your username based on? Uh oh, it's a long story. I used to be okay. So I grew up with worms, as in like the game. Okay. And it's basically the game that made me want to get into game development. Well, actually, it made me want to get into modding first. But also, it made me want to make games because I was fascinated by all the weapons and like the ways they interacted with the terrain. And so, Kilburn was actually the name of the producer of the studio that made the game, and his name is one of the default. Like it, his name is is also the name of one of the default teams when you started the game for the first time. And I kind of just shamelessly took it for myself because I thought it sounded cool. <laughs> That's a funny story. And then and it's, at some point, I, I joined the Team 17 forums, which is, like, which is the studio who made the game. And of course, Kilburn was already taken because the producer himself was there. So I just added that underscore <laughs> and that kind of just became my thing. And you just keep people the underscore now. Fun. Yeah, people actually made fun of me for it. Like they said, I just shamelessly stole his name. And at the time I was really young and I made a huge fuss out of, out of it. But later on I looked back and I thought it was pretty funny. And I figured I might as well just take that and make it part of my identity. <laughs> that's that's funny. I like that story. So um, yeah, that's that's it pretty much. Okay. Um how were you how were you introduced to the binding of Isaac? Uh one of my friends introduced me to it. Uh I actually I think I've told this story before, but I came very close to not playing it because I knew Edmund through Super Meat Boy. But the thing is I didn't like Super Meat Boy very much. It wasn't really my kind of game. And when I saw that the same person made another game, I just looked at it and I figured it would be kind of the same thing. So I wasn't really interested in playing it. And one of my friends were like, was like, oh, you got to play this. And he just like straight up, he, he straight up uh, started, um, he straight up gave me TeamViewer 
and a copy of the game and told me to play it while he was while, while he would watch. And I did, and then I couldn't put the game back down, and, and then you know you know what happened. <laughs> That's great. What games were your favorite when you were like? Do you have any childhood games that you still really love? Well, yeah, Worms. The entirety of the Worms franchise, pretty much. Uh, another game that got me interested in modding was Unreal Tournament, the very first one, the one that came out in '99. And later on, a friend of mine introduced me to Gary's Mod, which is, which was originally a mod for Half Life Two, but then kind of became its own game. And uh, I don't know if you know about it. It's basically a sandbox game, but it's heavily designed to be modded. And a lot of people made really interesting mods for it. And I was in the community for quite a while. And I think it's the game that really, really got me into modding. That's and then, cool. of course, there is there is all the mo- uh, there is all the games that run on the Source Engine. So, uh, Half Life Two, uh, TF Two, Portal. Uh, that's the games I basically grew up with. All right, cool. Yeah, Portal Two. I I love that game. <laughs> what do you think about? Um, do you enjoy playing procedurally generated games? more than like traditional ones like playing for example like spelunky as compared to something it, like super mario it really depends uh i like spelunky but i think the game does get kind of semi after a while it, it's not something i would play for a long time like i would play say isaac mm-hmm. uh, i think there are pros and cons in procedurally generated content like you can't really control the level design. You can control it in some way. Like in Isaac, every room is designed a certain way. But in something like Spelunky, the way the rooms are put together, there's a little bit there's a little bit less control over how each level is going to play. Yeah, like because the more random like it is, the harder it is yeah. to make the player feel of some sort of specific way. Yeah. And I think it's very apparent in certain games that the procedural generation just doesn't work. I, I used to be really into Crypt of the Necrodancer, which is an excellent game, by the way. Oh, yeah, I love that game. And I remember being extremely excited for uh, Cadence of Hyrule because, like, come on, Crypt of, the, Crypt of the Necrodancer, but, like, as a Zelda game, that's just incredible. But I, I think... I enjoyed the game a lot, but I felt like the procedural generation didn't really work there because like the two just don't go well together. Like you can't really have procedural generation and also a story mode that lasts several hours. Because as you play, you realize very quickly that the the world isn't designed a certain way it's just procedurally generated so you start to notice that things get saving very quickly which is something that would not happen if the world was entirely handmade mm-hmm. so i think there are pros and cons in both approaches uh, i think in some games procedural generation works better and in others it's better to have handmade levels mm-hmm. do you think that um do you think that Isaac like plays to the strengths of procedural generation? Uh, I don't think procedural generation actually matters that much in Isaac. Uh, because again, Isaac isn't actually that procedurally generated, at least when it comes to the rooms, because every room is just like every room is handmade. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, none of the rooms are generated, but the like the rooms are. The floors are generated, but that just changes the order in which you do. Maybe like generated isn't the so, right word, but like the, like the items random, that you get yeah, are random. Yeah, it's randomized. Yeah, it's random. It, it's a bit. I, I guess you could say that it's sort of procedurally generated, 
but like that's where its strength is like the fact that every run you do is going to be different because you have completely different items how much did nuclear throne specifically influence isaac because i've heard you mention a lot of things about like nuclear throne influence this this boss and stuff like that yeah uh it probably had a lot of influence. I used to play it a lot, uh, especially daily runs. Is that the biggest and influence on Isaac from you working on it? I'm not sure. Uh, it's probably one of the biggest ones. What would be the other ones? I I wouldn't know for sure, honestly. Like it's all it's mostly just I've mostly just learned things from various games I've played. Nuclear Front is just one of them. Uh, we tried to learn from Spelunky as well. Learn from what? From Spelunky. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, I think some concepts I've had also come from Crypt of the Necrodancer. Like, well, actually, Tainted Lost kind of comes from that in a way. Like, Crypt of the, Crypt of the Necrodancer has a character who dies in one hit but also has a free hit at the beginning, kind of like Tainted Lost has. And her item pools also only contain offensive items with just a handful of defensive items, but not as many as the other characters. So you kind of have the same thing going on where you have a very hard character who dies in one hit, but you're also almost always going to have a good one because you have less items to pick from, and most of them are usually good. Yeah, that's... So uh... I guess that has that, that had uh, some influence. Uh, Nuclear Prawn was mostly, like, the idea that it's more fun if you can kill enemies quickly, but they can also kill you as quickly. Because it means that you don't get, like, really agonizing runs in Isaac, like where you have a lot of health but you have no way to hurt enemies and then you kind of just slowly die because you just can't clear rooms quickly enough and so you're always taking a little bit of damage that's something we've been trying to avoid in repentance uh it still happens but it's not i don't think it's as common as it used to be yeah um i i agree that that used to be a problem like in after Earth plus it used to be so easy just to get like infinite soul hearts and then yeah. you just like you, you either, already won you, yeah you, you either get a really good run or a really bad run uh I, I think that was the main issue i had so so on isaac you were you were mostly just a programmer right and then you also uh, took the the designs that you made in um anti-birth and added them uh is that correct? What do you mean? Like, so um... for repentance, I did. So I did the, the programming. I also did some of the design, like enemies and bosses, and I also did the art for all the items. Oh, okay. I didn't know you did the art. That's cool. Um, which, like, in in your future projects, are you gonna? Which which of those are you gonna continue to pursue, or like all of them, maybe? Well... Well, it's going to be mainly design and programming. Like, I can do art if I have to, but I would rather leave it to someone who can do it better. Okay, that's interesting. Do you prefer, like, um, design over programming? Uh, I think both kind of go hand in hand. Like, I when I code something, I usually do a bit of design work in it as well. Like. You still have to figure out how to implement a certain thing. And there are many different ways to interpret a design document. But usually it's not going to have every single detail on how a boss or an enemy is going to behave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I remember um, in an interview before, Edmund said that like, he had told a programmer um, that like dark bum he wanted it to convert red hearts to soul hearts and the implementations that they both had in mind were totally different because he was like oh obviously you need more red hearts than you get yeah. soul hearts out of but then the the programmer didn't think yeah. that he was like oh one to one yeah 
they, so again, there are many different ways to interpret a design. So I, I think design work, like, like implementing something in code also takes design work in a way. Mm -hmm. Like you, you have to take the design you're given and then try to figure out what the designer meant by that. And that involves doing a little bit of designing yourself. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. You're you're only working on Isaac for the rest of this year, right? Yes. Um, when can we expect like some sort of new project to be revealed from you in the future? I have no idea. Uh, I mean, if it happens, I know about it, but right now I can't really tell. Do you think that you'll be working with Edmund again in the future? I don't know. Maybe. Another question. Um, when Repentance launched, there was a lot of like, a lot of like a uh, stuff that had been kind of missing, like the birthrights, for example. Um, was that example like were the birthrights missing because, um, you didn't think that players would get there so quickly? Uh, I just didn't have time to finish them. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Like we had we had a lot more things planned out, but then the deadline kind of came, so we had to finish whatever we had. Do you wish that you could have had more time to work on the game before releasing it, or do you think that you needed the like definite deadline to actually push something out? I, I think the way things happened were probably for the best, because if we had more time to work on the game, we would have like I probably have gotten more ideas, and then ended up trying to do even more things that wouldn't get finished in time. So it's probably better that we released the, the game when we did. Yeah, I remember that it, it was supposed to come out a lot way before, right? Like it was teased to come out yeah. way earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the thing is Repentance was supposed to be way smaller. We weren't going to do tainted characters or anything like that. And then like the more we went, the more ideas we had. And it kind of just became bigger and bigger. All right, and... um. I have one more thing to ask you. Okay, what what can you tell me about this item that Edmund mentions? Oh, it's a great item. <laughs> I can tell you. Is it is it the last him. secret of repentance? I mean, if I told you, it wouldn't be a secret anymore. <laughs> All right, good point. I'll I'll keep an eye out for this secret item. All right. Well, thank you so much for letting me interview you. This has been. Um, this has been really cool. Um, I, sure. I love Isaac. It's been amazing to get the chance to interview you. Awesome. I'm glad you like it. So when all of these aspects and wrinkles of the game accumulate, what kind of game is the final product? The Binding of Isaac is a roguelite, which incentivizes you to replay it over and over to unlock new game elements. These unlocked game elements don't necessarily make the game easier or harder. Rather, they are initially locked to prevent the player from becoming overwhelmed until they become more familiar with the things that are unlocked by default and the general game structure. Players can learn things through trial and error in the game, as well as through the use of very detailed and straightforward wiki and other resources. Once players get a basic understanding of how the game is played and what items do, the number of ways that the game can be played becomes wider, adding to the longevity of the game. The game's lifespan has already been lengthened by three DLCs, which contain significant amounts of new content as well as general quality of life improvements. There are some game modes that have been left underdeveloped in favor of focusing on the default game mode, which makes those underdeveloped game modes unintrusive unless you're planning on unlocking everything. The main game itself is almost flawless. The problems that exist in it are patched out in updates or can sometimes be fixed with a mod from the Steam Workshop. In my opinion, Repentance is by far the best Isaac has ever been, offering the most diverse meta with heaps of creative and fun content. Because of the game's incredible scale, there will always be edge cases of item interactions that will not work the way that you intuitively think that they should. But given that, I think that the main game mode, gameplay loop, and mechanics are as perfect as a game of its scope could possibly be. 
At a high level, I think that the game becomes very similar to an escape room, in which victory is always possible, even without optimal dodging, so long as you use your tools in creative and smart ways. After thousands of hours of learning how the game's items and mechanics work, I no longer even see the poop and blood that represents these things. Rather, I see pieces to a puzzle, which is solved by beating the final boss and completing your run. I cannot recommend this game enough. This video essay is my love letter to The Binding of Isaac, and I give Edmund McMillan and the rest of The Binding of Isaac team my utmost thanks. It's finally over. Wow. I've been working on this video for almost a whole year. I just checked. I made the doc for the script on July 5th, 2021. I honestly thought that it had been longer than that. I'd like to thank you for making it all the way to the end of the video. I really appreciate knowing that this huge project I've been working on is being seen. As I mentioned in the video, the link to my item tier list and item analysis will be linked in the description. I've wanted to make this video for years, since before Repentance when I was still in high school. This project has taken a lot of effort and a lot of time. To be honest, I don't know if I would have even started if I knew how long it would take from the beginning. I always knew that this would be a long video, but I was thinking long as in like 40 minutes, <laughs> not over two hours. I'm glad I did it though. This video has been the first real thing that I've made that I think is of much real merit. And it brings me a lot of satisfaction to know that I made it and did it all on my own. I've never done a lick of video editing before this. To be honest, I'm surprised that this turned out as well as it did, or at least as well as I think it did. I won't really know the unbiased perceived value until I upload it, I guess. I'd be very surprised if there wasn't at least one mistake in the script given the scope of the video and the game. So if you notice any, please leave a comment. I would genuinely like to know if I got anything wrong. And if you disagree with anything I said, let me know that in the comments as well. Keep the discussion going. I'm sure that if I just keep waiting, I would think of more things to include in the video to discuss or critique, but I need to get this out eventually, so this is it. And I'd like to thank Kilburn again for letting me interview him. It was really cool to get the opportunity, and I'm really thankful for his time. And thank you again to Kilburn, Edmund, and everyone else who helped bring this game to where it is now. This game's become very personal to me, and it has always been comforting to be able to play this game I'm good at and can always keep getting better at. Isaac makes sense to me, and it's helped me cope with times that I've been really sick. The Binding of Isaac will always have a special place in my heart, and I wouldn't be surprised if I never stopped playing it. <laughs>